The Oregon Trail, a 2,100-plus mile journey for some from Independence, Missouri, all the way to Oregon City, Oregon. A rough and rugged odyssey to the American Wild West, traveled mainly by American immigrant families looking to own land for the first time and build wealth in a new place. To claim their 160 acres, they faced a grueling, months-long journey, full of all kinds of hardships many of us can't imagine today. Extreme weather without the proper gear by today's standards, river rapids without the nice flotation device, starvation, disease, accidents, conflicts with other immigrants and local tribes, and the most shelter they had on the journey was nothing but a covered wagon. For decades, the Oregon Trail was America's symbol of manifest destiny, the idea that the United States was destined by God to expand across the continent and civilize the lands out west. Activity on the trail would peak in the 1840s and 50s, bringing hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children to the western territories of Oregon, Idaho, Utah, Wyoming, and California. The gold rush brought thousands more, primarily single men, looking to strike it rich beyond their wildest dreams. The trail was the path to the American dream for many settlers, property ownership, the potential for wealth and exploration and uncharted territory. Of course, every story involving territorial expansion has a dark side. Many of the settlers who started out in Missouri with big dreams of making new lives for themselves in Oregon never made it, and their lives ended in tragic fashion. Also, there were already thousands of people living in this quote-unquote free land, the Plains and Western Native American tribes. Initially, they were curious and accepting of the white settlers. They traded with them, offered them food and shelter, but they soon realized that the whites were going to keep coming and coming, continue depleting their resources, continue spreading their new diseases, and continue killing men, women, and children to get what they wanted. So they started to fight back. And that soon led to conflicts with the U.S. Army, displacement from their ancestral lands, and seemingly endless death and violence. The Oregon Trail was a fresh beginning full of possibilities for some and the end of a way of life that had existed for centuries for others. This week, we'll discuss the history and ideologies of United States expansion from Lewis and Clark to the Homestead Act, the Oregon Trail itself, life on the trail, the effects of westward expansion on native tribes, and so much more on another <laughs> Wild West edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, meat sacks. Get in here. We have to hit the trail, and you're late. We gotta get moving soon. We'll be dead by winter. Wait, it's October. Never mind. I'm calling off the wagon train. It started much too late. Let's just podcast. Dan Cummins is Suck Master, Trail Master, McGill's Pop Loophole, Reconstruction Surgeon. And you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, praise Lucifina. Make sure the trail looks good ahead, Bojangles. And throw on a 10-gallon hat and hop up on that wagon, Triple M. Thanks to those of you who came out to the shows and spoke hand this past weekend. Uh, so much fun, I'm guessing. Five full rooms. Hope I had fun with those. Recording this on the 15th. Uh, day, the day of the first shows, but before I got there, obviously. I uh, guess I had a pretty good time overall. The Symphony of Insanity stand-up tour continues in Kansas City this week. Added another show on Sunday if you want to go. Uh, Cincinnati, Denver, Tampa, Loveland, Colorado, and more coming up. Announcing 2022 dates soon. Feeling like a, a fun new hour is really starting to shape up. I'm, I'm enjoying myself. It's been fun, fun shows. Uh, fun new collection shirts in the store at badmagicmerch.com. Our in-house art warlock has whipped up what he's calling his cartoon collection. A Kroll's Cafe, mostly beef shirt. Chikatilo's little wiener shirt. Albert's uh, peanut butter butter shirt, all done in a late 70s, early 80s animated kid show design. They're uh, dark if you know, fun and cute if you don't. Super funny to me. Uh, last reminder that the October Bad Magic Charity of the Month is Rain Two Ends. Thanks to Patreon support, we have donated $15,600 to the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, America's largest anti-sexual violence organization. You can go to rain.org to learn more, and that's R-A-I-N-N. Uh, one last thing, uh, a little sense of humor reminder. Uh, if you're a new sucker and you're confused by some character abs or absurd reference, uh, it's a running gag that began in some previous episode. We have so many of them. Some Mr. X, just some weird shit. Dad Watch, Whipple, Albert Fish, David Childress, a lot of fake ads, etc. cetera. Uh, gotten some emails from some longtime suckers recently about how it can become annoying to hear constant reminders that something's a joke right after telling the joke, that it kind of like pulls away from the joke. And I like that feedback. I agree. I also like including everyone I can in the inside joke. So now, uh, you know, just a heads up here that once we're in, uh, you know, we're just going to keep it weird and not do so much uh, uh, exposition after the weirdness. So now let's put the fucking yip in the yaw. Grease up those axles. Hop onto the wagon. Time to further explore territory we visited back in the Donner Party suck. You know, they started off in the Oregon Trail and, well, 
Now, it didn't end well for them, if you recall. Uh, today, we're not deep diving that cannibalistic tragedy. Again, we're asking the question, how did the U.S. go from a small collection of overcrowded states to a vast, unexplored country overnight? The Louisiana Purchase marked the beginning of westward expansion and a series of government, social, and military events ultimately led to the first immigrants setting out on the Oregon Trail. Uh, how are we going to break down today's story? Uh, first off, uh, first, first off, like before first off, I do want to explain that I'm saying immigrant uh, with an E, the, the littler used uh, word that sounds a lot like immigrant. Sounds like my dad identical. So you're like, I said that a little bit funny. It's intentional. Talk about people migrating inside their country. Now, how are we breaking down uh, today's story? Well, uh, first, we'll start back in the 18th century, establish why America wanted to settle the West in the first place, cover some early exploratory expeditions, cover how the Monroe Doctrine and philosophy of manifest destiny fueled westward expansion. Then I'll go over the Homestead Act, explain how that gave a lot of people, uh, you know, 160 relatively free acres worth of incentive to hit the trail. Next, we'll cover the trail itself. What did you need to purchase to prepare for your journey? What was the journey like? What were some stops along the way? Dangers? What was daily life like for a migrating settler? I'll share a few journal entries from settlers that may uh, put your next road trip complaints into better perspective. Then finally, before the recap, we'll jump into a little timeline. I'll go over how Europeans found uh, the Oregon Territory, began settlement, then accelerated settlement great with the or Oregon Trail that lasted all the way until some new railroad tracks made it obsolete. So let's get to learning. After the French and Indian War ended in 1763, France surrendered part of Louisiana to Spain and almost all of the remaining territory north of the Caribbean and the Americas to Britain. They said goodbye to all of New France, which had included a huge portion of Canada and much of the American West, except, and this is so odd and fun to me, they refused to relinquish two little islands off the southern coast of Newfoundland, where a small community of French fishermen lived, St. Pierre and Miquelon. 12 miles from Point May on the Buren Peninsula of Newfoundland, uh, Canada, six miles east of the tiny Canadian island of Green Island, about 6,000 people live on these two little French, largely barren islands. And they still belong to France. It's an official overseas territory. Anyone born there, a French citizen. Almost everyone on the island can trace their ancestry back to France. They elect two representatives for French parliament. I love it. I want to visit these islands. I got sucked into some travel videos on them, and uh, they're fucking adorable. Little slice of Europe, just, just tucked into Canada. <laughs> and not like part of Canada. It's not like Quebec or something where it feels very European, you know, in some ways uh, more so than a lot of North America. This like, like they're connected directly. Uh, I love that France gets its ass kicked and then King Louis XV is like, fine, you can take everything we have in Canada and the American colonies, everything in North America, over 3 million square miles, but there are 93 square miles that I must keep. You cannot have St. Pierre and Miquelon. They're my favorites. I love those little islands with all my heart. They're the best caught fish. I cannot live without their caught fish. We'll fight to the last man for precious St. Pierre and Miquelon. I have no idea where that fucking person lived. I was French. I was French-ish. He comes from a weird part of France you've never heard of, okay? You, can, you know what? He fucking he comes from St. Pierre. Uh, Great Britain would actually invade these little islands 15 years later in 1778, kick all the French people living uh, there back to France, just fucking deported them. And then in 1796, King Louis XVI of France, King Louis XV's grandson, was like, fuck that! Give us our tiny islands back! Papa Louis loves these islands! We used to eat the sweet cod together! Uh, and then a treat in 1804 returned the islands to France, and they've been fucking French ever since. Why did France really care? Apparently, fishing rights. A lot of cod, a lot of crab, other commercial fish caught off these islands. For a couple centuries, best cod fishing uh, on the planet until they were depleted a few decades ago. Uh, that's the official story, fishing. Feels more like ego to me, though. France can now technically say, well, we did not give them everything. We still have our colonies over there, too. We have an important colonial power. I just can't believe I never heard of those islands. So fucking random. Finding that out was like finding that in the, in the middle of Lake Michigan, the UK or Spain or Portugal still has a colony. Or that Japan has a colony in the Puget Sound, just a couple miles off of, you know, from Seattle. I love strange anom anomalies like that. Okay. Back to 1763 and its effect on the formation of America. The suck won't be full of huge deviations from the narrative like that one. It just, you know, happened to pop up at the beginning and it was too good to ignore for me. Spain's acquisition of Louisiana in 1763 did not have much effect on the U.S. after the new nation was formed in 1776 because they allowed Americans to travel the Mississippi River and use New Orleans as a trade port, which at the time was all Americans wanted to do with that part of North America. 
Overall, early Americans had their hands pretty full, protecting their brand new nation from the British, various native tribes, making sure they could defend themselves, uh, you know, if the Spanish or French started making trouble. There was still plenty of land for early farmers and pioneers to settle east of the Louisiana Territory. Then when Napoleon took over France in 1799, he wanted to take back France's territory in the States, and he made a deal with Spain. He basically traded some territories in Tuscany, aka Northern Italy, for the colony of Louisiana. Fine. 1802, King Charles IV of Spain returned Louisiana territory to France, whatever. But then Napoleon revoked America's port access. Not fine. Why? Well, Napoleon was kind of a dick. Also, he wanted to build up an army in North America and try and take over that part of the world just like he wanted to take over Europe and the rest of the world. But luckily for America, he ran into some money problems. World domination can be very expensive. To raise a bunch of hell in Europe to make sure he could pay and clothe and arm and feed a huge standing army, he needed cash, lots and lots of cash. So he sold the vast territory to the U.S. Except for the two little islands. No no one gets the two little islands. Uh, I'm sure in Napoleon's mind it was a move of, sure, I'll sell it to you, you American idiots. And then once all of Europe is mine, I will take it back. Uh, We did a whole suck in Napoleon. Episode 134. Dude loved war and conquest. Happy to quickly greatly increase the size of their new nation in 1803. President Thomas Jefferson James Monroe negotiated a deal uh, with France to purchase Louisiana Territory. The United States purchased 827,000 square miles of land for $15 million, doubling the size of the country overnight. Funny how much the value of money has changed, isn't it? There are several homes on just a few acres of land on Lake Coeur d'Alene that cost a lot more than $15 million now. Back then, you could buy 530 million acres, over three times the size of the entire nation of France. And that includes those little islands by Newfoundland. Before the negotiations were even finished, Jefferson asked Congress to finance an expedition out west to get a feel for how easy to settle this new land would be. Find out who was already living there, what the geography was. Jefferson asked his personal secretary, Meriwether Lewis, to lead an expedition west of the Mississippi. Lewis chose William Clark to be his co-captain. Clark, at the time, was working as a fluffer on the set of some local dawn of the 19th century porno shoot. Uh, Porn back then was live theater. He was helping with a production called King Georgie Porgy Puddin' Pie Hold. I'm not going to waste time going over the plot details. I think you get the gist. It's a talk of Virginia. No, of course not. Uh, No, Clark was an experienced military man who had handled himself well in numerous skirmishes prior to the expedition and understood how to navigate a map, manage supplies, keep a fellow traveler hard like a proper fluffer. No, uh, you know, other other things pertaining to the expedition. Uh, Lewis and Clark's journey across the continent would open the door to westward expansion via the Oregon Trail a few decades later. On May 14th, 1804, the expedition, called the Corps of Volunteers for Northwest Discovery, set out into the unknown from St. Charles, Missouri. Today, St. Charles is basically a suburb of St. Louis. Back in 1804, a little town of less than 1,000 people at the time, originally settled by French-speaking colonists from Canada, it was considered the last civilized stop on Lewis and Clark's journey west. Lewis and Clark party consisted of, uh, obviously, captains, 29-year-old Lewis and 33-year-old Clark, uh, 27 unmarried soldiers, a French indigenous interpreter, a contracted boat crew, and York, a man enslaved to Clark. A lot of historical speculation as to what happened to York. Some think that after the expedition was over, Clark refused to give him the freedom he supposedly promised and beat him and forced him to continue being his personal servant. Another narrative is that he was given freedom and horses and a wagon, set up to basically work as a deliveryman, but it didn't work out too well, and he soon died of cholera, McGill's pop. And the most popular narrative is that he left the expedition in present-day Wyoming on the way back, became a chief in a band of crow, and ended up with four wives. Sadly, not uh, much other than speculation as as to what happened to old York. The big expedition would last over two years. Man, that's a hell of a long time for essentially a fucking camping trip. I love camping, but over two years? That feels a bit excessive. I'm more of a one weekend, and then fuck this. I'm sick of bug spray, sunscreen, and sleeping bag kind of guy. Over two years, that's a long time to go without a hot shower and without sleeping in one's own bed. Not that they had, you know, showers or nice mattresses back then. But still, not that adventurous. If given the choice, I would have uh, 100% for sure taken a hard pass on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now I'm good, guys. Uh, life sucks bad enough in 1804 in general. I already hate living in this time and place. No need to make it worse. I'll meet you guys for some warm whiskey served out of a dirty glass when you get back. And you can tell me all about it, and I probably won't care. Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery were some of the first European Americans to confront the lands out west. 
Random pioneers and fur trappers had ventured out west before them, but this was the largest expedition to truly see how one coast of America could connect with the other coast. So I guess I would like their stories. That's pretty amazing. Uh, the expedition wasn't easy, as you can imagine. They faced starvation, disease, injuries, tense relations with native tribes, many of whom had never seen white men before. They presented Jefferson peace medals to tribe members, informing the tribes that their land was now part of the United States, subject to U.S. laws and regulations. I'm sure a lot of those tribes were like, yeah, 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 Jefferson, United States, blah, blah, blah. Cool story, bro. Take care. They promised peace and friendship. That, of course, would not quite be how shit would work out. Uh, in 1804, while in North Dakota, the, the group met Sacagawea, a Shoshone woman who had been taken captive by the Mandan and Minotauri tribes. Sacagawea, her husband, Toussaint Charbonneau, a French-Canadian fur trapper and explorer, and their baby would travel on the rest of the journey with the Corps. They were hired as translators. Sacagawea served as an important symbol of peace and acted as a guide for parts of the journey. She was invaluable. Uh, Toussaint, he was okay. Uh, they were the first group of Americans across the continental divide via the Lemhi Pass, often pronounced Lemmy by fellow Idaho mushmouths like myself. About a six hour drive from the Suck Dungeon here in Coeur d'Alene, right on the Idaho Montana border. Two hour drive from Butte, Montana, hour drive from Salmon, Idaho. One time, very important pass, uh, very seldomly used now. Just a little Idaho 13 heading over the border there. One lane in each direction and windy as shit. The expedition traveled through the Bitterroot Mountains, where the pass lies, on through present-day Idaho, and finally reached the Pacific Ocean on December 10th, 1806. After waiting a few months for winter snow to melt in the mountains, they headed back east, returned home on August 11th, or I'm sorry, August 12th, 1806, bringing with them invaluable geographical knowledge. They created maps, geographical notes, identified 120 previously unknown to Americans animal species, 200 new bot uh, botanical species, established somewhat peaceful relations with dozens of tribes. Their journey strengthened American claims in the West and opened the gateways for Americans to flood the land beyond the Mississippi. And maybe most importantly for today's story, they proved it could be done. You could make it to Oregon via an inland route from the new former, or from the, you know, the new former colonies. They inspired countless explorers and immigrants, most of whom would later travel along the Oregon Trail. The only real aspect of the Corps of Discovery's expedition that was considered a failure or a disappointment was their failure to find the fabled Northwest Passage. Northwest Passage was thought to be a famed sea route from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean through a group of sparsely populated Canadian islands known as the Arctic Archipelago. Uh, explorers looked for it for centuries. Europeans first started searching for it in the 1400s. Countries wanted to claim the Northwest Passage because it you know, would give a direct route from Europe to Asia. Controlling the passage meant controlling a major trade route and thus having economic power over rivals, but they never found it. You know, because uh, it doesn't really exist. I mean, that's not entirely true. It does exist, but not in the form they were hoping for. Only in a very extremely impractical form. Not in a way that would have helped any of the colonial powers at all. Uh, the Northwest Passage is 900 miles from the North Atlantic, north of Canada's Baffin Island in the east, to the Beaufort Sea, north of Alaska in the west. It's entirely within the Arctic Circle. And uh, Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen, was the first to successfully navigate the passage in 1906. And it took him three terrible, brutally cold, how is this fun on any level years to do it. He and his crew of six men were iced in numerous times for several months at a time. He had to leave the ship more than once, do shit like ski hundreds of miles to go get and then bring back some supplies. It was a fucking shit show, but he did it. Uh, this passage is now used for com commercial shipping in a very limited fashion. In 2014, a Norwegian commercial ship was the first to make it through without an icebreaker, icebreaker leading the way, hauled a bunch of nickel from Quebec to China, made it in 26 days, a lot faster than the 41 days it would have taken to go through the Panama Canal. Even now, though, it's only used by a handful of ships every year and, uh, you know, only during a few months in the summer. Back in Lewis and Clark's day, it would have been a death wish to try and cross that. After Lewis and Clark returned with their tales of uh, what kind of lands lay west, the citizens of the U.S. and the government became, you know, very expansion-minded. Although the term manifest destiny wasn't coined until 1845, the idea was present in the minds of thousands of people well before then. Manifest destiny, defined as the idea that the United States is destined by God to expand its dominion and spread democracy across the entire North American continent. Human history man, sh uh, shaped so significantly by so many notions of uh, what no one has ever conclusively proved, right? That A, God exists in some form, you know, known by religion, and B, that God wants you to do this or do that. I think I'll be forever fascinated by that. 
a notion of what some God that may exist and may have said this or that uh, has truly been such a defining force for so many lives, cultures, empires, etc. We live in lands today carved out largely by these ideas. I sure do. You know, 19th century America, a lot of early Americans truly believed that God wanted them to head west and take new lands for themselves, for God, raise Christian families there. For me personally, I got to say, thank you, early Christian settlers. If it wasn't for your godly efforts, uh, my white non-religious ass uh, certainly would not be living in such a beautiful place. This philosophy drove westward expansion in the 19th century and was used to justify removal of, you know, local tribes from their ancestral lands. Manifest Destiny also created problems with slavery as new states were being added as America pushed west. Some white settlers, mainly from southern states, obviously, wanted to work their new lands plantation slavery style. Other settlers did not. In this way, westward expansion driven by Manifest Destiny would lead directly to the Civil War. Economic misfortune combined with possible new economic opportunities also fueled westward expansion. I would say this economic component was the main driver of expansion. It's always been the main driver of expansion. Money. Even if you think God wants you to head west, if you are fucking killing it back east, making money hand over fist, and heading west could likely spell financial ruin for you and your kin. Are you really still going to hop in that wagon and hit the long and dusty road? I doubt it. Some would still do it, the most faithful, you know, maybe some zealots, uh, some uh, clergymen. But I think most of the world's going to be like, you know what? When I really think about it, I I, I think I heard God wrong. I think God does want me to stay here and keep my job, keep my job right here. Uh, Believing that God wants you to head west and that you will financially prosper out west, unlike your current situation, well, that was the winning, let's go settle some shit ticket. Uh, God and money, that combo has uh, truly, as the saying goes, made the world go round. From 1800 to 1850, the U.S. population exploded from roughly 5 million to roughly 23 million, mostly due to high birth rates and immigration. And this uh, relative overcrowding also pushed people west. Many eastern states had become overcrowded for their day back when people needed a lot of land to farm, back when people weren't living in high-rise apartment and condo buildings, working in tech or pharmaceuticals or customer service or whatever. It was a a different kind of crowding. And because of this relative crowding, lower-class families had limited opportunities for land ownership. Adding to financial problems, uh, for many were two depressions, one in 1819 and one in 1839. The Panic of 1819 was the first substantial and prolonged financial crisis the young nation, you know, or the U.S. of fucking A., had ever experienced. It lasted until 1821, was partially brought on by global market adjustments in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon! Caused a lot of carnage over there. Also partially brought on by the U.S. government not regulating inflation and managing currency and leaving that up to private banks who thought they could just basically print monopoly money to pay any debts they had and not suffer consequences. And then that monopoly money became about as valuable as actual monopoly money. And there was a wave of foreclosures and overall financial panic. Uh, simplifying that tremendously for the sake of staying on track with today's subject. In 1839, a period of four years of depression and deflation began. More foreclosures, more economic turmoil, more incentive to head out west in search of land and economic opportunities. You know, head out west and start over. Also, there was the Monroe Doctrine. This is important. Need to go over this. 1823, fifth U.S. President James Monroe invoked manifest destiny when he addressed Congress. He warned European nations not to interfere with westward expansion. Uh, Any attempts by Europeans to colonize American continents would be considered a declaration of war. And this led to the official naming of the Monroe Doctrine, which established an American sphere of influence and promoted non-intervention in European affairs. Monroe spoke of an old world and a new world, and that each had their own sphere of influence. And that just like the U.S. had no business meddling in the affairs of Europe, Europe needed to stay the hell out of the Americas. It was very much a, you worry about your neighborhood and you stay the fuck out of ours way of thinking. We don't fuck with you. You don't fuck with us. Cool. The Monroe Doctrine became a cornerstone of U.S. diplomacy for many years. And settling the West was part of it. It wasn't an official piece of legislation or anything. It was a philosophy, a mentality. It wouldn't actually be officially called the Monroe Doctrine until the 1850s. But the mentality began in the 1820s. In the early 1820s, many Latin American countries won independence from colonial powers like Spain and Portugal. The U.S. government recognized the new republics of Argentina, Chile, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico in 1822. Britain and the U.S. worried that their continental European powers would make attempts to restore their authority in those regions. Monroe initially supported joining with the British against further colonization in Latin America until Secretary of State John Quincy Adams argued that allying with the British could limit U.S. opportunities for expansion. He wanted Monroe to make a unilateral statement of U.S. policy that would set an independent course for the nation 
and claim a new role as protector of the Western Hemisphere. And Monroe did just that on December 2nd, 1823, during his customary message to Congress. His address asserted that, as I just mentioned, the old world and new world are fundamentally different and should have two separate spheres of influence. The U.S. should not interfere with Europe, and, you know, Europe should not interfere with the uh, the colonies and, uh, you know, uh, the North and South America. The American continents, by the free and independent condition, which they have assumed and maintained, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for colonization by any European powers, he said. When Monroe gave this address, the U.S. was not even a century old, still considered a minor player in world affairs. Monroe didn't have the military or naval power to back up such a bold claim at the time, and Europe largely was like, ah, shut the fuck up. But then as America grew more powerful, you know, they're like, okay, all right, okay, we'll respect your wishes. The U.S. didn't actually invoke the Monroe Doctrine until 1867, uh, when they supplied military and diplomatic support to Benito Juarez in Mexico, which allowed him and his forces to overthrow Emperor Maximilian, placed on the throne by the French. From 1870 onwards, the U.S. became a world power, and the Monroe Doctrine was used to justify further interventions in Latin America. In 1904, Theodore Roosevelt added the Roosevelt Corollary, or Big Stick Policy, that the U.S. would exercise international police power in response to any wrongdoing. And we have definitely been policing the world ever since Teddy motherfucking Roosevelt uh, laid that down. So how does all this relate to the Oregon Trail? Well, the United States badly wanted to settle the Wild West before some European power tried to interfere, interfere, <laughs> or interfere, you know, one of those things, uh, with our sphere of influence and settle it first. The U.S. government wanted to make sure we didn't directly border some foreign extension of European military power directly to the West, Easier to stay independent if you control all the ports to both the East and the West. Having a war with Spain or France or Britain when they're across the Atlantic is one thing. Fighting them when they're sending in troops from present-day Minnesota, Nebraska, Iowa, California, Texas, etc. Well, that'd be quite another. Speaking of Texas, Tejas. Let's now shift focus to Texas, a key state in early westward expansion. In 1820, Moses Austin, a U.S. citizen, asked the Spanish government in Mexico uh, shortly before the Mexican War of Independence for, for permission to settle Texas. He was granted some land and then died soon after in June of 1821. His son, Stephen F. Austin, took over that land, advertised in New Orleans for other Americans to join him, form a new American colony. A few months later, Mexico gains independence from Spain in the fall of 1821. Austin then negotiates a contract with the new government for the land he had. He's permitted to take 300 families to settle some land along the Brazos River. And then more than 300 families come. Additional Americans continue arriving. Eventually, they outnumber the Mexicans living in Texas. And then the Mexicans, you know, do a little gringo head count. And they're like, hey, wait a minute. 1830, the Mexican government takes measures to stop American immigration. Mexico, after winning independence from Spain, passed a law suspending U.S. immigration into Texas. At the time, there were more, you know, because there was more American settlers in Texas than Mexicans. Mexicans. U.S. citizens protested for the re-annexation of Texas then. They want to pull it into America. 1833, Austin seeks statehood for Texas uh, in the Mexican Federation, actually. He was imprisoned after calling on settlers to declare statehood without getting consent from Mexican Congress. He would not be released until 1835. Uh, while he was in jail in 1834, Santa Ana, a soldier and politician, becomes dictator of Mexico, seeks to end the Texas Rebellion. There's a, there's a lot of chaos going on in Mexico for like a couple decades in this time. In October of 1835, English residents of Gonzales, Texas, respond to Santa Ana's orders to return uh, a cannon by firing at Mexican soldiers sent to retrieve it. It borrowed the cannon for defense against some local tribes. This was considered the first, uh, you know, shot fired in the battle of the Texas Revolution. Uh, American settlers quickly set up a provisional state government. A Texas army led by Sam Houston would go on to win a series of small battles in the fall of 1835. We went over some of this in a lot more detail in the 41st episode of Time Suck, the Texas Rangers episode. Uh, in December of 1835, Texas volunteers under Ben Millam drive out Mexican soldiers from San Antonio, settle around the Alamo, a former mission compound converted into a military base. January of 1836, Santa Ana concentrates a force of a few thousand soldiers south of the Rio Grande. Sam Houston orders that the Texans abandon the Alamo. Colonel James Bowie, old Bowie Knife Bowie, uh, who arrived at the Alamo on January 19th, realized that they couldn't move the cannons in time. So he stays behind with his men. He realizes if he can delay the Mexican soldiers, Houston will have time to raise a larger army. On February 2nd, 1836, Bowie and 30 men, they joined a small cavalry under Colonel William Travis. A week later, Davy Crockett and 14 Tennessee Mounted Volunteers arrive. On February 23rd, 1836, Santa Ana and 3,000 Mexican soldiers seized the Alamo for 12 days. On March 1st, 1836, the last Texas reinforcements broke through enemy lines and into the Alamo, bringing their total soldiers up to around 185. 
under 200 men fighting against several thousand. The Alamo really is a legendary, just kind of Sparta, you know, type battle. On March 6th, Santa Ana orders his soldiers to storm the Alamo. Just over an hour, all the remaining Texan and American volunteers are killed in hand-to-hand combat. Just a few women and children survive. The men that died basically sacrificed themselves so that Texas could become part of the U.S., and in that sense, it worked. Six weeks later, a large Texan army, given time to form during the siege of the Alamo, commanded by Houston, surprised Santa Ana at San uh, uh, Jacinto. And actually, I should say, correction, there's so much uh, historical stuff happening right now. It's fucking a little chaotic. Texas, uh, they, they, they sacrificed themselves so Texas could become its own country, which I'm going to cover here in a second. And I, even though I know it, I constantly forget them. I'm like, oh yeah, Texas was its own country for a while. Uh, six weeks later, a large Texan army given time to form during the siege of the Alamo. Yeah, commanded by Houston, surprised the Santana at San Jacinto, shouting, remember the Alamo. <laughs> right? Dun, 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 dun. They defeat the Mexican army. They capture Santa Ana, who was then forced to recognize Texan independence and withdrew his forces south of Rio Grande. Then on March 2nd, 1836, the Convention of American Texans meets at Washington on the Brazos, a little community that is still a little community, a little unincorporated community in Washington County, Texas. And they declare Texan independence from Mexico. They chose David Burnett as a provisional president, Sam Houston as commander-in-chief of all Texan forces. They adopt a constitution protecting slavery, which was prohibited under Mexican law. And Texas sought annexation into the U.S., uh, while for nearly a decade existed existing as an independent republic. So I guess you could argue they fought either for you know joining the U.S. or for Texan independence because they had to be independent for a while and then would join the U.S. later. Uh, the fact that they were their own kind of country, I guess that really uh, helps helps me understand the independent spirit of Texas. It has the most independent spirit I think of any state in the country by far. You know, from 1836 to 1846, yeah, they did exist as a sovereign state. <laughs> bang, 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 bang. Little, little air banjo deep in the heart of Texas. Uh, initially, Presidents Jackson and Van Buren resisted Texas annexation. Uh, they feared it would start a war with Mexico, anger Americans who thought annexing Texas was a move to expand slavery. In April of 1844, Texas became eligible for admission to the states as a U.S. territory. Uh, Congress actually opposed the agreement. President John Tyler... Literally completely fucking forgot that dude was ever president. I did. I had to double check the research before including him. I'm like, who the hell is President Tyler? Uh, he pushed the bill through and did sign it before he left office. Uh, and why again would Congress oppose Texas? Well, for a while there, it was you know didn't want to start another war with uh, you know Mexico. But there were other reasons. Uh, and one of one of those reasons was dick size. A survey was taken, and it was found that Texas dicks are 30 to 40 percent smaller than dicks from the rest of the U.S. Uh, it was true then, and it's still true today. And Congress didn't want to appear weaker, you know, to Europe in the intercontinental old, old world versus new world annual big dick contest uh, due to Texas dragging down the U.S. national, you know, average dick size. Uh, JK, of course. Uh, no, Congress opposed Texas due to Texas being pro-slavery, like I said. You know, and Congress was already full of pro and anti-slavery factions, bringing tons of discord to legislative sessions. If you think America feels divisive now? And I think it does compared to recent decades. You know, we are not nearly as divided as we were the couple decades leading up to the Civil War. Uh, 11th U.S. President James Polk, pro-annexation candidate. He personally was pro-slavery in the South and the West, supported his presidential campaign. Uh, He took office in 1844, and then he allowed Texas to be admitted as a state in 1845. Now, with the acquisition of Texas, the idea that U.S. expansion was inevitable had fully captivated the minds of U.S. citizens in all regions, economic classes, and political leanings. Go West, young man, was on a lot of young men's and, uh, you know, quite a few young women's minds. The term Manifest Destiny then appeared in an editorial published in the July-August 1845 issue of the Democratic Review. It's not an official term yet, but it's at least being printed now. The writer encouraged national unity on behalf of the fulfillment of our Manifest Destiny to overspread the continent allotted by Providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. In July of 1845, the phrase appeared in the New York Morning News, possibly written by John O'Sullivan, editor of the Democratic Review uh, and the Morning News. In December of 1845, another Morning News article mentioned Manifest Destiny in reference to the new Oregon Territory. Uh, The Oregon Territory was first established in 1842, a year after the first true Oregon Trail wagon train headed out west. Or wagons. Seven years after the first migrant wagon train was organized in Independence, Missouri. Uh, In 1836, a wagon trail had been cleared all the way to Fort Hall, Idaho. Most of the way to Oregon City. I always wondered if that hall was related to me through my maternal grandpa. Ward motherfucking hall. Papa Ward. Since the halls go, you know, way back in Idaho. 
If the relation is there, it's distant. Fort Hall uh, was not named after a guy in Idaho. I might have mentioned that in the Pop Wars. It was named after a major investor from back east who helped fund the 1834 expedition that founded the fort, Henry Hall. I'm not sure Henry even ever saw his namesake fort. Anyways, prior to 1836, fur traders, trappers, you know, true mountain men, they've been heading west for a few decades. Back to 1842, that year, a treaty between the U.S. and Britain, the webster Ashburton Treaty, uh, resolved the question of where to draw the Canadian border. The treaty left the Oregon Territory open to U.S. settlement. This massive piece of land stretched from the Pacific coast to the Rocky Mountains, covering the modern-day boundaries of Oregon, Idaho, Washington, and most of British Columbia originally. Poe campaign with the slogan, 54-40 or fight, referencing the potential northern boundary of Oregon's latitude. He called the U.S.'s claims to Oregon clear and unquestionable. In his inaugural address, Polk wanted to acquire Oregon so the U.S. could then focus on taking California from Mexico. Mexico would retain possession of portions, uh, you know, of or all of present-day Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming for two more years. In mid-1846, Polk's administration agreed to split Oregon along the 49th parallel, narrowly avoiding a major conflict with Britain. Britain, which still directly controlled Canada, did not love that slogan of 5440 or fight. They were like, um, you know that we already claimed that area, right? We were actually planning on calling it British Columbia. So I guess we'll have to fucking fight then. And then Polk was like, what? Come on. Ah, you wait. Didn't, didn't you hear the slide whistle after what I said? I was joshing. 49th parallel. That's what I wanted for realsies. Uh, by the time early settlers were putting down permanent roots in Oregon, the U.S. had worked things out with Britain. The U.S. didn't have time to fight Britain because they were now at war with Mexico. Manifest destiny. Yeah, God wants us to beat you back down south. And by south, we actually ideally mean way east, all the way back to Spain. Get the fuck out of here. Jesus loves us more than you. Mexican-American war really was part of the country's manifest destiny narrative, an attempt to assert American supremacy across the entire continent in an ideal scenario for the U.S., from sea to shining sea and from the Arctic Circle to somewhere south of the Panama Canal. If Americans, you know, some of them ideally had their way. Papers like the American Review discuss changing Mexico's customs and outliving, out-trading, exterminating her weaker blood. Eek! Weaker blood, Jesus. Easy, American Review. Easy. Many people such as future President Abraham Lincoln, abolitionists, ministers, and Henry David Thoreau opposed this war. War lasts from 1846 to 1848. was the first armed U.S. conflict fought mainly on foreign territory. That is Mexico. On February 2nd, 1848, the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ended the Mexican-American War, added 525,000 square miles to the U.S. Mexico gave up the, that land I mentioned earlier, parts are all of the future states of California, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Wyoming. The treaty recognized that the Rio Grande, the Rio Grande, that's the new U.S.-Mexico border. Mexico also officially recognized the annexation of Texas and agreed to sell their land for $15 million. So... Deep in the heart of Texas. Uh, interesting fact about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Gold was first discovered in California just a few days before Mexico ceded their land. Ain't that a bitch? Thanks for the land, Mexico. Good fight. So much gold, by the way. <laughs> Holy shit. Like the most. We just found it. We're talking, we're talking more gold than Cortez took from the Aztecs. We'll send you some earrings and a cool bracelet or something. The most important, uh, important historical event that took place during the final stages of the trail was the American Civil War from 18, or I'm sorry, from April 12th, 1861 to April 9th, 1865. We did a Civil War suck, episode 188, if you want to check it out. Uh, the Civil War obviously led to something long overdue and wonderful. The emancipation of American, uh, African-American slaves also led to a lot of death and turmoil. Recent historical estimates uh, place the death toll at roughly 750,000. A lot of family breadwinners are lost. A lot of farms and plantations lost during and after the war. A lot of people with new incentive to try and rebuild new lives out west. Also, the Homestead Act of 1862 made settling the west more appealing than ever. Signed by President Lincoln, May 20th, 1862, the Homestead Act allowed citizens to register for 160 acres of public land if they paid a fee and lived on the land for five years. 270 million acres, roughly 10% of the country, was settled under this act. Before the Homestead Act, historians described land distribution policies in America as arbitrary and chaotic. Fun. Properties overlapped. <laughs> awesome. Border disputes were common. A lot of hog folk, dog folk. Hatfield McCoy type feuds. A lot of shootouts kicked off over. It's my land, Nathaniel Jenkins. I have my papers. The hell you say, Rutherford McGinley? I have papers that say different than you. I think. Neither one of us can read. Let's fire. 
Let's, let's fight. Uh, the land ordinance of 1785 had been the first standardized system of federal land surveys leading up to the Homestead Act. Territory had been divided into six square mile or six mile squares, whatever, same difference, called townships. Each township divided into 36 sections, one square mile or 640 acres. An individual is required to purchase a full section. This was a huge investment and the labor needed to clear the land and establish a settlement was too much for the average American. By 1800, the minimum lot was reduced to 320 acres and a four installment payment plan was implemented. The price was fixed at 100 and, or I'm sorry, $1.25 an acre until 1854, but it was still too much for a lot of Americans. 1854, federal legislation established a graduating scale that adjusted the price per acre based on lot desirability. Some undesirable lots were reduced to just 12 and a half cents an acre. For those interested in a whole bunch of dust, rock, and ragweed. For those desiring some of that uh, sand and sagebrush land. Fuck yeah, bro. Look at all this land that I own. Free and clear. And just cue some panoramic view of cow skulls, ant hills, vultures, sandy soil, dry creek bed, a few mangy coyotes. To give further incentive to settle, the U.S. government extended bonuses to veterans, anyone interested in settling the Oregon Territory. This made Homestead, uh, that, that act, a viable you know, uh, option for more people. I'm sorry, not act. This made homesteading a viable option for more people. But previous to the Homestead Act, it was still widely unattainable for most Americans. Let me explain why. Before and after the Mexican-American War, there was pressure for the federal government to change land policies. In the 1830s and 40s, the price of corn, wheat, and cotton enabled large farm and plantations to outcompete smaller farms. Displaced farmers were looking for land options, but they didn't have enough cash to buy, you know, huge acreages. Before the Civil War, people demanded preemption, a right to settle first, pay later. But time and time again, the government shot that concept down. Eastern legislators opposed it because they worried that their factory labor would just flee west. But then, by the time the Civil War kicked off, a number of developments supported the growth of homesteaders. An unprecedented number of immigrants brought economic prosperity to the country. New canals reduced dependence on the New Orleans Harbor. England's repeal of corn laws opened up new markets for American farmers. Preemption became a hotly debated matter of potential national policy in 1852, 1854, and 1859. But the Senate defeated those measures each time. Then in 1860, a homestead bill providing federal land grants was passed by Congress and then vetoed by 15th President James Buchanan Jr. Jimmy Jr., a man many uh, presidential historians think was the worst president of all time. Fucking Jr. And uh, after Jr. was out of the office during the Civil War, the Northern states were temporarily their own country, no longer had to worry about Southern labor concerns, which is why James Buchanan shot it down. So in 1862, Lincoln moved to sign the Homestead Act into law. And when he signed it, he allegedly muttered, fuck you, Jimmy Jr. JJ can suck my honest ape dick. Maybe, maybe he muttered that. I wasn't there. Now, under this act, acquiring land was made even more financially possible than any kind of preemption law. Under this act, you wouldn't have to pay for anything uh, directly for your land. Not at first, right? You, you, you could buy the land if you wanted for, for $1.25 per acre after six months, or you could just pay a filing fee for 160 acres for as little as 10 bucks. Then you pay a $2 commission when you show up to your land agent. Then after five years of working that land, a $6 final filing payment. So you could purchase 160 acres of farmable land for as little as 18 bucks. So, you know, it wasn't quite free, but it's pretty damn close. After the war was over, the Southern states would just have to retroactively accept this. There were three steps to the homestead acquisition process. File an application, improve the land, file for deed of title. Right after five years, you know, a homesteader could file for deed of title by submitting proof of residency and required improvements to a local land office. Work the land until the land is yours. No purchase necessary outside of sweat labor and $18 in filing fees. Uh, always got to be some fees. Almost nothing's totally free. Uh, you know some homesteaders bitched about that 18 bucks, right? Or at least maybe about like the $6 filing fee at the end. Maybe they forgot about it after five years of farming. And they're like, what? Six bucks? You want six bucks? Do I look like I'm made of money? How about, how about I open a vein and you just take my blood too while you're at it? Greedy ass Uncle Sam need my six bucks. The country's going to fall back to the British or some shit, I guess. January 1st, 1863. Daniel Freeman makes the first claim under this new act. At a New Year's Eve party, he convinces a land office clerk to open the office just a tick after midnight so he can file that claim first. I love his enthusiasm. Uh, and soon he was heading out west to present-day southeast Nebraska. Nebraska. Just a few miles outside of the present-day town of Beatrice, Nebraska. And he jumped into a whole heap of hardship and hard work in addition to a lot of land. Getting those 160 acres 
uh, that sure as shit didn't put you on easy street. Life was hard for Daniel and other homesteaders. Although the land was cheap or free, many homesteaders did not last five years because of blizzards, drought, disease, you know, plagues of locusts, loneliness on the open prairies, the occasional psychotic neighbor. Uh, you know, after they made it to the West, they faced winds, blizzards, plagues of insects, yeah, la- limited natural resources, fuel, water. 160 acres, not enough to sustain a large farm. Difficult to raise livestock, actually. I don't know shit about farming personally, so sounds like a lot to me, but, you know, I guess compared to like uh, gigantic farms, 160 acres wasn't quite enough. Uh, they faced extreme yeah, loneliness in many cases. You know, they just lived so far from any town or mail route or railroad in so many cases for so long. No roads in a lot of cases. You know, they had land, but for many, they didn't have much of anything else. Sounds like hell on earth for me. I feel like that situation would lead to me thinking something like, you know what? I think I do want to be a stagecoach robber. Better than dying of boredom out in some dusty field. Those who could last at least five years were often rewarded. Quickly developing railroads made it easier to get supplies and travel and soon increased the value of their land and the ability to make money off that land substantially. Unfortunately, while the Homestead Act technically opened lands up to uh, any U.S. citizens of any race, Because free blacks were denied U.S. citizenship until 1868, they missed out on a lot of the best land. And because natives were not considered U.S. citizens, a lot of the tribes whose lands had just been taken and given to homesteaders could not become homesteaders themselves and try and get that shit back. So mostly, not surprising here if you know uh, much about the history of the Western world, the Homestead Act was for uh, white folk. (laughs) Please allow this white guy to, uh, I don't know, uh, slide whistle my way out of this awkwardness and transition. Moving along with all that history now established, let's take a look at life on the trail for settlers, followed, of course, by our timeline of the trail from beginning to end with uh, mentions of some notable people and events and some of the acts that led up to the beginning of the trail. Uh, It took the pioneers roughly four to six months, approximately 2,170 miles of travel to reach Oregon City, Oregon from Independence, Missouri. That was the full length of the trail. Somewhere between 250 and 500,000 people traveled on that trail between 1841 and 1869. Pretty rough estimate since they didn't have some, uh, you know, like ticket booth at the beginning of the trail. Some, somebody doing a head count, like you're walking into Disneyland or something. Also, the trail was used after 1869, just not nearly as often because the railroads connected the east and the west beginning in May of 1869. And while the Bartleson Bidwell Party was the first immigrant group credited with using the Oregon Trail to immigrate west in 1841, smaller groups of people, people who forged the beginning of the trail, did head out and make it to Oregon earlier than that. Uh, The Oregon Trail from the very beginning wasn't the only way out west. Immigrants could also sail uh, all the way down around the tip of South America, Cape Horn, and then back up to, uh, say, San Francisco. That would take anywhere from three and a half months to a fucking year. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Quite a bit of variance there. Uh, Apparently, some boats provided a little faster ride than others. uh, and, And generally, I guess it was closer to a year. That's a long time to be seasick. If you struggle with that like I do. Again, I am out. Hard out. I would have just stayed where I was. I would have tried hiking my way down to Florida or something. Live on a beach. Eat lots of fish and oranges until I die of malaria or something. Uh, It was around a 15,000 mile journey to travel that way. So uh, many miles at sea. The journey from a London port to a port in New York City, that's less than 4,000 miles. To sail around the Horn from east to west coast USA, almost four times that many. Right? Four times that many miles in in a shitty ass early 19th century boat. Fuck that. January of 1855, a railway was completed across the Isthmus of Panama. Then you could take a boat from the East Coast to the U.S. down to Panama. Then you could take a 47-mile rail journey, then get on another boat and sail up the West Coast. But that was super risky because traveling through the jungle of Panama, you could come down with, you know, cholera, malaria, yellow fever. (laughs) Then check this out. This is so ridiculous. In Panama City, on the West side of Panama, you might be stuck for several months (laughs) waiting for a ship to take you up to San Francisco. A lot of sailors who crewed boats from Panama to San Francisco refused to come back and they would just abandon their boats in San Francisco Bay. For a few years, San Francisco Bay had so many abandoned boats, they started using them for temporary housing. Dudes would just get there and then be like, fuck that. They'd take off and go look for some gold or go homestead themselves or whatever. They're like, we're not going on a fucking shitty ass boat back to Panama. That reminds me of getting like an e- email notification today, notifying me that my flight has been, you know, canceled and I've been put on a different flight, you know. N- now my two hour layover is a six hour layover. And I'm like, God damn it. Well, thanks for ruining my whole day, Delta. <laughs> Except back then, <laughs> if you were supposed to sail on, say, October 20th, you would get a notification that your ship had been canceled and that you'd been rescheduled for like February 15th. <laughs> Except you wouldn't be rescheduled. They'd be just like, fuck you. Buy a new ticket. <laughs> 
That would suck so bad. For several decades, the Oregon Trail was far and away your best option of making it from Missouri to anywhere east of Missouri. Or, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, of uh, making it from any, from Missouri or anywhere east of Missouri to basically anywhere west of Missouri. So you chose to take the trail. When did you get going? For overlanders, timing was everything on this journey. Immigrants had to be in St. Joseph or Independence, Missouri, or near one of those places as uh, more stops got going later on, in early April to start their journey, you know, by the middle of the month. If they tried to head out earlier, the weather wouldn't be right for travel. And if they got out later, they'd be snowed in and have to winter in the Western mountains, which uh, often meant death. You know, you don't want to be like the ill-fated Donner Party. Also, if you left too late, the grass could die early and there wouldn't be any food for your livestock. If you left too early, the grass wouldn't have grown in enough yet. Wouldn't be enough food for your livestock. It's tricky. In St. Joseph and Independence, that's where you'd buy everything you needed for the journey. Food, tools, wagons, animals, where you'd hire uh, trail guides. Reminds me of the old Oregon Trail computer game I used to play in school. A lot of us did. Early PC game, first released in 1978 for the Apple IIe. The 1985 version, that was the one that was just like widely released in schools all over America. I'm sure many other countries, that's the one I played. Well, I guess it wouldn't be in other countries. Why would they fucking care? <laughs> Why would I assume that? No, America. And uh, yeah, it was released in, uh, or it was, you know, continued, continued to be distributed until 1993, that version. I, and I found a sweet free emulator online at visitoregon.com. And I've been playing the last couple of days. And, I'm, and I haven't been doing well. So how about, I, how about I play along while I tell this story? We'll find out if my party can make it or not. Uh, before I begin, uh, let me consult, consult historical experts regarding uh, what me and Lindsay and Joe and Logan and Zach will need for a wagon train journey. All, and then the, uh, in, you know, all the in-office staff will come along for this ride. We'll see who lives, who's dumb enough to drown or die of cholera or get a fucking snake bite or something. <laughs> Joe hasn't been doing well in the practice rounds. He's been getting a lot of snake bites. Well, we'll see how well I can hunt for this party. Uh, it would cost between $800 and $1,200, roughly equivalent to $28,000 to $42,000 in today's money, to properly outfit a wagon. Get all of the stuff, stuff you needed to survive a whole year without being able to harvest any crops. The Immigrant's Guide, published in St. Louis in 1849, gave a list of supplies for three people. Historians often reference this as a standard supply list for immigrants. You need, you know, food, obviously, flour. <laughs> this is crazy. 1,080 pounds of flour. <laughs> Uh, 600 pounds of bacon, 100 pounds of coffee, five pounds of tea, 150 pounds of sugar. I feel like if it was somebody today, it'd be like a thousand pounds of sugar, 10 pounds of flour, uh, 75 pounds of rice, 50 pounds of dried fruit, 50 pounds of salt and pepper, 10 pounds of baking soda, 50 pounds of lard. Travelers also recommended to buy cornmeal, hardtack, dried beef, molasses, vinegar, eggs, and beans. Oh, hardtack. Hardtack is a crackerish biscuit thing made out of flour, water, and salt, if you're fancy. It was cheap to make, and this shit lasts forever. They still have re recipes for hardtack on prepper sites. And they claim if you keep it dry, these calorie rocks will last anywhere from 30 years to literally over 100 years. <laughs> Not kidding. They're super hard, super dry, and best case, they have virtually no flavor. Worst case, it sounds like they taste like they're made out of fucking dried buttholes and vomit. Uh, you need cooking supplies on your journey. Oven, skillet, kettle, coffee grinder, teapot, knife, ladle, tin tableware, water cake, matches, tools, you know, plow, shovel, rake, hoe, carpenter tools, saw, mallet, axe, spade, whetstone, plane, axles, king bolt, ox or mule shoes. Obviously, depending if you got an ox or a mule, uh, oxen, you have multiple spokes, ropes, chains. So far, the supplies have not included anything fun. I double checked. And I didn't see a Nintendo Switch or iPad or porn mags or even a Frisbee. Uh, next, you need some seeds, corn, wheat, other seeds. That would suck to make it all the way to Oregon. Realize you forgot your fucking seeds <laughs> back in Missouri. All right, family. We lost Lucy and Grandma Nettie, but the rest of us made it. Manifest destiny. All the sacrifice was worth it. Now we're going to grow the most crops anyone's ever grown. We grab the seeds here. We're going to, okay, who, where's the seed? Just going to grab these seeds. Just going to, oh, God. Jimmy, you forgot the seeds, didn't you? You, you fucking idiot. Now we're dead. Uh, also had to bring weapons. Rifle, shotgun, pistol, knife, hatchet, powder, lead, bullet mold. Right, got to make your own bullets. Often cases, or you need to. Help, help, be helpful to do so. Powder horn, bullet pouch, holster. You know, your rifle, your shotgun, your pistol all jam up. You lose them, run out of ammo. Better be good with a hatchet. I have to go old school, real old school. Carve yourself a spear. There's clothes. Wool coats, rubber coats, cotton dresses, buckskin pants, duck trousers, cotton shirts, woolen undershirts, 
cotton drawers, flannel shirts, cotton socks, boots, shoes, ponchos, felt hats, and sunbonnets. Sunbonnet might seem like an inconsequential thing to bring, but remember there was no sunscreen. There was people walking beside the wagon. Most people were walk next to the wagon along the trail, walking all day, every day for months across a Midwest summer. You're going to burn your fucking scalp off if you get that bonnet. Going to end up looking like Freddy Krueger by the time you make it to Oregon if you're not careful. Also need proper bedding. Walking all day tends to wear a meat sack out. Going to want to sleep on something other than rocks and sticks and bugs. If you want to get enough rest to complete your journey, you're going to need uh, blankets, ground cloths, pillows, tents, poles, stakes, ropes, jerk-off rags, diddle rags, JK maybe. Probably be best off shooting your seat out in the dirt, maybe under the side of a tree. Not on the trail, though. You don't want to make it more slippery. You don't want to accidentally kill another pioneer when they slip on your seed and break a leg or something. Now, you got to do some good old-fashioned tree jerking. Maybe wipe those diddle DJ fingers off, off on some prairie grass. Most settlers did bring some kind of luxury items. Uh, still no switches, uh, though. Uh, more like canned goods, plant cuttings, books, instruments, toys, family albums, jewelry, china, silverware, linens, iron stoves, furniture. Rocking chair would be pretty sweet. Get a little bit of sunset rocking in after a long day of walking. Other items might include surgical instruments, liniments, bandages, stool, chamber pot, wash bowl, lanterns, candle molds, tallow, spy glasses, scissors, needles, pins, threads, toothbrushes, soap, comb, brush, and towels. Not even kidding on the spy glasses. Not quite as cool as they sound, though. Basically a small telescope so you can see up ahead. If you're approaching a grizzly bear or something, you know, you know it's, uh, maybe some other meat sacks that don't look too welcoming. Well, you might want to get uh, your rifle ready. A little bit. Prep a little bit before you run into them. All right, now it's about time to fire up that old Oregon Trail game. All right, so, uh, okay, I got to get my team going here. First, let's uh, start off on the Oregon Trail game. It says, you know, you mean travel on the trail, learn about the trail, see the Oregon top 10. Ah, fuck that. Let's go. Let's go travel the trail. That's what we're here for. All right? You want to be a banker from Boston, carpenter from Ohio, farmer from Illinois? You know what? <laughs> Joe's yelling something. I want to be a carpenter. Okay, carpenter from Ohio, because, you know, Joe's got family in Ohio. Lindsay's from Ohio. Let's be a carpenter from Ohio. Uh, what is the first name of the wagon leader? Okay, so I'm, I'm the wagon leader, and I'm going to be Whipple. So I'm going to be Whipple the wagon master. And then other members of the party, let's have Lucifina. That will be Lindsay. Uh, let's, have, let's have burgers. That'll be Zach, because for many years he lived off of only burgers. Um, <laughs> for Logan, let's have Showbiz. He's gonna be Showbiz guy, and then uh, for for Joe, <laughs> we're gonna have Little J. Uh, and I love I love the Little Joe stuff because he's actually uh he's actually on the bigger size of a guy, <laughs> and somehow it became like he became a little guy in the suck for suck world, but he's not at all. Okay, so they've got our team here. Are these names correct? Yes, they are. It's 1848. You're jumping off. It's Independence, Missouri. You got to decide which month to leave. March, April, May, June, July. Well, they just told us April, right? We just came across in the, in the research April. I think March is too early. May is too late. Now it says before leaving Independence, you should buy equipment and supplies. You have 800 bucks. I've been practicing a little bit, so it would be too tedious. But, I, but, I, but I've also been dying, so this might not work out very well. Don't have to spend it all now. Okay, space bar to continue. You can buy whatever you need at Matt's General Store. All right, Matt. What, what are you selling today, Matt? He says, hello, I'm Matt. So you're going to Oregon. Aren't you perceptive? I can fix you up with what you need. A team of oxen to pull your wagon. Clothing for both summer and winter. Okay, Matt. Plenty of food, ammo. We got it, Matt. So now we're going to buy some shit. Oxen. Okay, I got to get... He says he recommends at least three yoke oxen. There's two oxen and a yoke. He's charging 40 bucks a yoke. Fuck it. All right. There we go. Three. You know what? I'm going to get four. I'm going to get four yokes because last time I played, some son of a bitch stole six of my oxen. In the middle of the night. Food. We're going to need a lot of food because I'm very bad at hunting because you only have the left, right, up, down arrows on this particular keyboard, which doesn't uh, allow for angles. So the fucking bears and deers have to be coming straight at me from the left or right or straight above or below for me to shoot them. He recommends at least 200 pounds of food for each person in your family. Okay, we have five people. So I should get, you know, I should get 1,000 pounds. How many pounds do you want? Yeah, Matt, I do want, I want 1,000 pounds. Now we have... Uh, we have 440 bucks left. Clothing. We need some clothing. Matt's saying you're going to need warm for the mountains. You need two sets, you know, because it's going to be cool clothes for the, for the summer. Recommends two sets per person. Each set's 10 bucks. Well, I got, you know, five people. So I got to get 10 sets of clothing. Oh, now I got 340 bucks left. Ammo. 
I'm fucking shit with a rifle on this game. Sells ammo in boxes, 20 bullets, $2 each. I don't think that there's any way in hell I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot more than 10 boxes of bullets. So now, spare parts. I got 400 or 320 bucks left. Now, this, is, this, is, this screwed me the last game. Wagon wheel, $10 each. Uh, wagon axle. He says, good idea to have a few spare parts. How many wagon wheels? Uh, I'm going to get six wagon wheels. Let's get a lot of wagon wheels. I'm going to get six. I'm going to get, no, I'm going to get three, four axles. Oh you, can, oh, you can only carry three wagon wheels. Well, fuck. Oh, all right, Matt. I'll max out. Max wagon wheels. How many axles? Three. How many tongues? Three. Okay. Now we got a uh, $507 bill. We have uh, 230 bucks left. Let's go. Let's leave the store. We're ready. He says, good luck on your journey. He says, it's going to be long and difficult. Ahead of, fu- shut the fuck up, Matt. Why are you being a Debbie Downer? Telling me my journey my journey's going to be hard. Independence, April 1st, 1848. Press spacebar to continue. Going to continue on the trail because we haven't even got started. Here we go. The weather's cool and the health is good. Got my food, 1,000 pounds, right? I'm just fucking moving along. Oh, goddamn ox wanders off. I just lost three days. It's not, not good. I got a dumb ox to start my journey. Like out the gate, he wanders. Okay, going to make it into some kind of river. And you have to make some choices. The rivers, that's where you can lose a lot of people. I'm at the Kansas River. Uh, would you like to look around? Yeah, I would. Want to see- okay, it's April 10th. I'm not seeing shit. There's no other people there. So I'm going to continue on the trail. Let's see how deep it is. Ooh, four and a half feet deep. 626 feet to cross. I feel like I might have some smaller party members and they're going to drown. So I'm not going to be able to just drag them across. Now I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to cock the wagon and float that shit. I'm not going to take a ferry. I don't think it's that crazy. Okay, best of luck. Here we're going. We're moving. Please don't capsize at the start. Please don't capsize. I'll just quit. Uh, all right, we made it. You had no trouble. Victory. From the Kansas River, 82 miles to the Big Blue River crossing. Let's get to moving. All right, I'd like to make it to Fort Kearney if I could on this initial, initial part of the journey. Highly recommend playing this too if you get a chance. It's pretty fun. Oh, God, Lucifer has a broken leg. Lindsay's leg's broken. I haven't even made it to the second river. <sighs> okay, I got a size of the situation. I'm going to give her a few days to, I'm going to stop and rest. But only this once. She can't get her fucking shit together. We're just going to have to keep pushing on here soon. I'll rest. Okay, I'll rest for five days. We started early. Lucifina, Lindsay. Now it's April 20th. Slowing us down. Now I'm going to make it to the river. Big Blue River crossing. Would you like to look around? No, I don't. I don't want to look around. I just want to get moving. You must cross the river in order to continue. The river at this point is currently 228 feet across. Oh, it's only 2.1 feet deep. Fuck this river. I want to ford this river. Option one, moving along, not a problem. We got one dumb ox. Hopefully he doesn't lead me into some rapids. Okay. It was a muddy crossing, but I did not get stuck. This is the best I've done thus far. Now, okay, for this next little segment of the show, we're just going to go 118 more miles. And we're going to make it to Fort Kearney, hopefully. I got 670 pounds of food left. Haven't had to hunt. Haven't had to size up the situation outside of, you know, uh, one little broken lake. Almost made it to Fort Kearney. Uh, you are Fort Kearney. We'd like to look around. Yes, I would. Hey, Fort Kearney. There's a bunch of other wagons. There's a dude on a horse. And a nice little brick building. And then we'll get back to that uh, in a little bit. Now that we've made it, uh, where we can resupply, let's talk about supplies. Forts and trading posts were the primary resupply stations. Early on, they were, uh, you know, real few and far in between. For quite some time, there were just, you know, seven forts along over 2,100 miles worth of wagon trail. That averages out to just one every 300 miles. Moving 15 to 20 miles a day in a wagon train, that could mean you're, you know, three weeks out from another fort. And what if that fort is out of goods when you get there? It wasn't like you could just go across the street and buy something from a competitor. And you might not be able to afford supplies. The traders at forts did have. That shit was expensive. Right? You get to load up at the start of your journey because supply and demand, baby. Demand tended to be real, real high for a trader's supplies, so they would jack the prices up. And if some other seller was willing to pay more for you than what, than what you needed, you know, to buy what you needed to finish your journey, well, then tough shit for you and yours. Uh, there are, you know, other little trading posts that would pop up and go away here and there, but, but there weren't many. Okay, in addition to uh, supplies, hopefully, forts also provided protection along the journey. The one place immigrants could fully relax knowing that they were protected by the U.S. military. 
Let's travel through this game a bit more. Let's check in our supplies. Uh, I'm going to buy some supplies. I'm going to talk to people first. Let's see what this um, shithead has to say. A Fort Carney scout tells you, the game is still plentiful along here, but getting harder to find with so many overlanders. I don't expect it to last more than a few years. Folks shoot the game for sport. Take a small piece and let the rest rot in the sun. Well, it's a, that's a shame. I don't know. Okay. I don't know how that affects my journey. Uh, now let's attempt, uh, let's buy some supplies. I'm not going to trade yet. Need more food. Uh, everything's, nothing's broken yet. So let's just get some food. Oh, it's only 25 cents a pound. That's a good deal. Actually. Let's get some food. Which number? I have 230 bucks. How many pounds? Eh, let's get 200 pounds. Let's get 250 pounds. I think. Okay, good. 250 pounds. We got 167 bucks left. Let's get the hell on out of here. Let's leave the store and get to fucking trailing. Fort Kearney, it's 250 miles to Chimney Rock. Off we go to Chimney Rock. Let's see how the little guy makes it. Okay, weather's warm. Health is good. Got 800 pounds of food. You know, we've traveled roughly 400 miles now. It's uh, early May. Nothing nothing dramatic. Uh, now, the, now the soil's it's getting hot. The ground's a little, little browner than it was. Now getting uh, moving through the food, but we are cruising. We are cruising along. Nothing dramatic. Making it to that next landmark in less than 15 miles. Here we are. Chimney Rock, would you like to look around? Yeah, let's hear some music. All right, there's a rock. Super cool. Super cool rock. Let's get to fucking moving. There's nobody hanging around the rock. I want to try and make it to Fort Laramie. That's coming up in 86 miles. Oh, I found some wild fruit. Well, fucking awesome. Uh, let's keep let's keep on moving. Inadequate grass. Found more wild fruit though, so the oxen are doing great. This is like a miracle that it's going this well. Uh, no one no one's died. This is insane. You passed a grave site. Would you like to expect closer? Yes, I would. Here lies Voland. Hey hey hey, come out and play. Okay. Computer programmers better at programming than writing tombstones. That was the best they could come up with for this game. It's the first like little jokey thing you see. Hey, 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 come out and play. What, is, what does that even mean? Now we've made it to Fort Laramie. Would you like to look around? Yes, I would. Oh, there's people to talk to. There's a crazy looking uh, mountain man guy. There's a local tribe member uh, and also a weird like solo white horse. We'll come back to that. Many immigrants worrying about not bringing enough uh, overloaded their wagons. They were worried about paying you know expensive prices down the down the road. And then they had to end up dumping excess items soon after leaving Missouri. It was common to see luxuries and family heirlooms dumped along the trail, but you'd never see tools, guns, you know, food left behind. If Lindsay and I were traveling together in a wagon train for real, uh, we would for sure get in some fights about want versus need. You know, it'd be stuff like, uh, yeah, I understand you're pissed at me, you know, for throwing away 65 pounds of fucking skincare products off the wagon. But you don't need that shit, no matter how many times you say you do. And then she'd be like, well, you didn't need, you know, 50 pounds worth of graphic novels. So out that goes as well. And then, you know, cue screaming okay uh abandoned items were called uh leverites short for leverite here later on some thrifty mormon settlers made a nice profit out of salvaging the leverites reselling them to immigrants passing through salt lake valley i love that doing some early thrifting before the wagon trail left the men uh, usually elected a captain to lead the way immigrants uh, joined up into parties or large companies for help and protection a single family traveling alone was very rare Outside of these forts, there was no law enforcement of any kind. So wagon trains came up with and enforced their own laws. I found that interesting. The most successful groups had written constitutions, codes, resolutions, bylaws. They could refer to when there was a conflict. There were rules for camping, traveling, restrictions on gambling and drinking. There were penalties for breaking the rules agreed upon by the members of the party. There was also sometimes a form of uh, social security for sick people, widows and orphans and provisions established for disputes over the possessions of deceased party members. Noice! Conflict resolutions. Uh, many people said goodbye to their family for the last time when they made this journey. You know, they were, gonna come, they were gonna come back and visit for the holidays. They head west to start a new life, and it would take them over four to six, or, you know, anywhere from four to six months to get to where they were going. From Independence, the wagon trail followed uh, the Little Blue, Platte, Sweetwater, Snake, and Columbia Rivers through Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming, Idaho, and Oregon. Again, they'd, you know, they'd travel around 15 miles a day. Oh, man, so much work to do that, too. So easy now. If you map the trail by cities or towns, rather, small towns, the trail went from Independence, never much more than 3,000 people during its years as a jumping off point, to Oregon City near Portland in the Willamette River Valley, never much more than 1,000 people during the trail years, for most of it closer to a, just a few hundred. 
Uh, Oregon Trail was one of two main routes west, the other being the Santa Fe Trail from Independence to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Additional branches from the trail provided routes to California, the Salt Lake region, you know, soon enough. Independence was the original starting point, but immigrants could also leave from St. Joseph, 20 miles north. And within a few years of the trail getting going, there were several jumping off spots in the area. California branch of the trail traced the same route until the split at Fort Bridger, Wyoming, uh, Soda Springs, or Raft River in Idaho. I had never heard of Raft River before. Name sounded like it was made up to me. I looked a little further into it. Tributary of the Snake River down in southeast Idaho. Seems to originate not too far from the great metropolis of Malta. 200 people living around Raft River Junior and Senior High School. And not a whole hell of a lot else. Hasn't grown much since its Oregon Trail days. But they do have Black Pine Steakhouse. I love getting into weird wormholes in the web and finding random trivia like this. I was making fun of Malta, and then I found this one restaurant. I checked out the Yelp and Google reviews, and this place looks legit. Apparently, Holly works there. Hi, Holly. Never been there, but uh, Holly may be the owner based on the reviews, and apparently she's very nice. Uh, so many five-star reviews. Nicole Christopherson, one of many who love it, said, The food was amazing, and the portions were huge. My steak was cooked exactly how I was asked, and mashed potatoes and shrimp were great. There was something on the menu for everyone. Even my pickiest eaters. Top-notch service. I will definitely be back. Amazing steak and shrimp in Malta, Idaho, along the Raft River. What a time to be alive. Good job, Holly. Uh, back in the Oregon Trail days, guessing the best food you could find was uh, some fish you caught yourself, local game, maybe some previous settler's hardtack they threw out of their wagon after breaking a fucking tooth on it or something. Uh, immigrants went through the Utah and Nevada deserts till they crossed the Sierra Nevada mountains, descended into Sacramento and beyond. That route popular in the 50s during the gold rush. Uh, major forts along the trail, Fort Kearney, Fort Laramie, Fort Bridger, Fort Hall, Fort Walla Walla, and Fort Vancouver. Immigrants usually marked monuments along the way to leave helpful notes for other pioneers. Over time, wagon trails left clear paths to follow. I love how the trail was built. With the Oregon Trail, it wasn't like a county or state or federal work crew you know, was building a road. Or it wasn't like a, the Forest Service was knocking out a really nice trail with park benches and bathrooms here and there. No, first early pioneers, mountain men, shit, you know, they walked through, rode along the, you know, through pure wilderness on horseback. And then after many years of that, some early wagon, you know, uh, immigrants in the mid-1830s went along, cleared a, the path of bigger rocks and brush that would stop a wagon. Then more groups would clear it further later on, you know, and so on. It was more like a human game trail than a road, like a, like a human version of a deer trail carved out by nothing more than a bunch of deer walking across it. Cool how something that rough, you know, provided the means for so many to make it to the West. Major landmarks were Blue uh, Mountain, Courthouse Rock, Jail Rock, Chimney Rock, Scott's Bluff, Laramie Peak, Devil's Gate, Twin Buttes, Flagstaff Hill, Mount Hood, and uh, many others. Platte River was considered the first gentle leg of the journey, allowing immigrants to uh, settle into life on the trail. The Oto tribe called the Platte region Nebraska, meaning, meaning flat water. The French word Platte means the same. The Platte River Valley terrain was ideal for wagon parties because it was, you know, flat and provided plenty of water and grass. Uh, travelers considered it the easiest, most enjoyable part of the journey. There was flowers, animals, sand hills, rock formations, not too many struggles. Most uh, immigrant journals complained about the dirty water, uh, swarms of insects, and, you know, what they would call quicksand, just, you know, really like kind of heavy mud. Some people saw buffalo for the first time, would collect buffalo chips to burn as firewood. That's uh, dried pieces of buffalo shit. Tastes a lot like hardtack, what I understand. Uh, immigrants got used to hitching and unhitching the oxen, wagon maintenance, foraging for firewood and clean water cooking over an open flame and learning to break and set up camp each day on the first leg of the journey. And, got it, and better clean that water good. Don't drink that river water unless you want to catch some cholera and McGill's pop your loophole off. Cholera killed more Oregon Trail settlers than anything else. Uh, various sources say uh, between 1 in 20 and 1 in 10 settlers died trying to make it out west. When the wagon train reached Chimney Rock, Scott's Bluff, they were a third of the way there. The real challenges now began. Firewood and supply depots were scarce. Buffalo herds thinned out. Wagon parties had to cross fast rivers in the Continental Divide. They faced the summer heat. There was no trees, meaning no shade. Dust constantly kicking up. Immigrants also lived in fear of uh, being attacked by local tribe members, which, as we'll go over here soon, wasn't actually a huge concern. Let's see if I can get my wagon party or uh, to the Continental Divide alive now. All right, let's let's move move it along. Come on, I gotta I gotta buy some more supplies though first at this fort. Uh, let's see. I'm going to get probably some more food. Ah, it's 30 cents a pound. I should have bought more at the last place. That's okay. Okay. Let's get 300 pounds. Can I get that many? I think so. I'm trying to do some quick math here. 300 pounds of food. Oh, fuck yeah. I got 77 bucks. Let's get out of here. Let's leave the store. 
I've been real lucky. I haven't broken anything. I don't even want to talk to anybody. We got we to gotta get moving. Daylight's wasting. Fort Laramie, it's 190 miles to Independence Rock. Let's get moving. Chugging along. Not, no oxen's even gotten lost since there. Lucifer has been fined. All right, keep uh, keep going, keep going. I'm down to 800 pounds of food again, but I've made it 736 miles. This is great. I'm a, I'm a pro now. I can do this in real life, easily. You know, if I, if I can do it, you know, one out of three times and make it on the game, I got to be able to do it in real life. <laughs> now I've made it to Independence Rock. We like to look around. Yes, even though it's stupid. I saw it before. Okay, yep, rock. Let's get out of here. Uh, weather's cool, health is good, so I'm gonna continue along on the trail. It's 102 miles to South Pass now. Let's get moving. Come on, Burger. Showbiz. Come on, Lil J. Let's get to walking. Keep moving those feet. All right, we're only 40 miles to the next landmark now. 18 miles. I don't know how the hell we're doing this. I was kind of hoping for some more uh, tragedy. Would you uh, like to look around the South Pass? Yeah, let's hear some more music. Hey, there's a, there's another person. Let's see what he wants to talk about. I'm going to press this uh, space bar. Talk to people. Yeah, what's going on, buddy? A Mormon traveler tells me, my family and I travel with 40 other families to the Valley of the Great Salt Lake to seek religious freedom. Back east, Mormons are persecuted. In Utah, we'll join together to build a new community, changing desert into farmland. All right. Okay, that's cool. Good luck. Uh, attempt to trade? Nope. I don't need to do shit. This has been the craziest. Oh, the trail divides here. Oh, no. Oh, God dang it. Uh, Green River Crossing or head for Fort Bridger? I don't know. I can't remember. I'm going to go for Fort Bridger. It's 125 miles. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Get going. Come on, Burger. Mo let's fucking move it. Whip, whip those oxen, Lil J. This is ridiculous. What do I have it set on the, the nothing ever happens setting? <laughs> I was hoping somebody would break their leg. I found wild fruit. I don't fucking care. I want some drama. I don't, uh... Now I have 380 pounds of food. Okay, Fort Bridger, would you like to look around? Yeah, sure. Okay, some other people. Uh, I'm gonna buy. I'm gonna buy some more supplies. I'm gonna spend. Well, I probably shouldn't. I only have 77 bucks now. Food's 35 cents a pound. I'm gonna buy 100 pounds of beef, and then I'm gonna have to hunt eventually. How many pounds? 100. Oh God, I have 40 bucks. Let's get out of here. Something's gonna break down, and I'm, I'm not gonna have anything. I'm gonna be screwed. I normally talk to people, but we got to get moving. I feel like this is boring because nothing's happened. It's 162 miles to Soda Springs. Okay, let's get going. Weather's warm. Health is good. This is the easiest this game has ever been for me. I've traveled over 1,100 miles now. All right, we're uh, 90 miles to wherever the hell it was, Soda Springs. Oh, God! Severe thunderstorm. Okay, just lost today. It sounded scarier than it was. Whatever. Health is still good. Man, my fucking team is moving. Suck dungeon, not fucking around on this trail. Now we made it to Soda Springs. You like to look around? I guess so. A uh, bunch of people taking baths or something. I don't want to talk to them. They seem creepy. I don't need... Uh, 57 miles to Fort Hall. We are fucking cruising. Yes! Come on! 210 pounds of food. I don't have enough money for anything else. Oh my god, we made it to the Fort Hall. No, I don't want to look around at Fort Hall. Let's just keep it going. 182 miles to the Snake River Crossing. This is where some of us could die. Okay. 150 pounds left of food. Getting a little low on food. All right. Okay, 100 pounds left of food. This, uh, we're going to start starving soon. Uh, this, okay, this is how I'm going to die. Uh, broken wagon tongue? Would you like to try and repair it? Yes, I would. You were unable to repair the wagon tongue. You must, okay, I'll replace it then. Now we have 45 pounds of food. Oh, shit. Oh, God. Now we have 15 pounds of food. Now we have zero pounds of food. We have, okay, all right, all right. But health is, health is fair. Health is decreasing quickly because I've had zero pounds of food for a while. Now I'm gonna have to hunt a little bit here. Let's see what we get. Okay, I'm out here with my little dude in the corner. Oh, shoot that squirrel, come on. I shot a squirrel. Now he's gonna block my fucking, God damn it, squirrel. Now you blocked all my other food options. Fuck you. Come on, bear. No, all I'm gonna get is a squirrel. This is, okay. Oh, God, I can't, I can't move. And the game is limited. 1985, I got a little pea shooter, and there's a, there's squirrels in the way. No, deer, deer, come on, no. Oh, God, this is terrible. This is the worst hunting I've ever done. I got, 
I got two pounds worth of meat. Okay. All right. Let's, let's, uh, we got to hunt again. I'm in a better position now. Come on, a bear coming. There's a bear coming. Ah, I got a bear. All right. And I'm in a good position for more animals. There's a couple plants around me, not blocking anything though. All right. I'm going to get a hundred pounds of food, food out of that bear. You bet your ass. There's a deer. Fuck you, deer. Got that deer. There's another deer. I don't even need you other deer. I'll shoot you anyway. Nothing else. Nothing else. Come on. Let's wrap it up. Probably shouldn't be wasting ammo like this. But it's like the way the bullet sounds. Look at that. 100 pounds. But yeah, hell yeah. That, now we can continue on the trail. You pass a grave site. Would you like to inspect it closer? Here lies Jiffer. That's literally all it says. Who fucking wrote this game? It's not even a joke there. Now we're making it to the river. Would you like to look around? Nope. You must cross the river in order to continue. The river at this point is currently 1,000 feet across, 6.2 feet deep in the middle. Okay. That means we're going to try and cock the wagon. Let's fucking go. Cocking the wagon. Floating, 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 floating. Come on. Please don't capsize. Or, I don't know. I guess if you do, it'll be exciting. <laughs> you had no trouble. I'm the best wagon master ever. Now it's on our only 113 miles to Fort Boise. Let's fucking move it. But we only got 25 pounds. Oh, no. Lucifina has exhaustion and no food. Okay. All right. Uh... I'm going to, I'm going to size up. I'm going to size up the situation. You know what? We're going to, we're going to stop there. We're going to stop there. We're going to, we're going to check on Lucifina in a bit. I'm going to do some hunting. Let's talk about the last leg of the real journey. Extremely difficult. Immigrants face the blue mountains in Eastern Oregon, the Cascade range. We're not too far from that in the game. They try to move as fast as possible. Worrying about winter approaching because how much would that suck to be on the wrong side of the last pass? A bunch of snow starts to fall. Say your prayers, little Jimmy. We gave it our all, but we're probably going to die now. Apparently, our manifest destiny was to become human popsicles. When, when immigrants reached the Dalles, a one-time mission settlement on the Columbia River, now in Oregon State, and a cool-ass town where I once got Bob Seger his Night Moves album for two bucks at a thrift store. Fuck yeah, bro. Uh, they had to decide if they wanted to take the Columbia River. Or in 1846, a new option, safer but longer, Barlow Road, named for Sam Barlow, early settler, may have been among the first U.S. citizens to summit Mount Hood. Uh, his road became the preferred route for immigrants. Until 1846, when Barlow Road was created, everyone had to float from the Dalles to Fort Vancouver. Now, floating a wagon down a river, floating across one, fording, aka pulling one across the river, all dangerous options. Good way to drown or lose your shit. Even if wagons were properly prepped and loaded, fording rivers was at best a risky endeavor. Wheels could drop into holes, cause wagons to overturn, quicksand could bog wagons down, making it very difficult to pull out and perhaps cause a capsize. Fording required ingenuity to get the wagon down the bank into the water, up the bank on the other side. Pioneers would use picks and shovels to cut down stream banks to get their wagons down the incline and into the water. Other times, men would gently ease a wagon down the steep slope by tying a long rope to the axle of the wagons. Settlers learned to angle their wagons as they crossed rivers to prevent uh, the current from hitting it broadside, knocking it over. When sufficient timber was available, the pioneers crossed rivers by building ferry boats. That would take some time. Sometimes they'd float two wagons across a river that had been tied together with ropes and poles. Strong current could still roll them over, though. Uh, most of the time, they'd go one wagon at a time, but they'd put the wagon on a makeshift raft called a scow. But that was uh, excruciatingly slow. And then the oxen, you know, would swim across. Between 1848 and 1853, most overlanders took the main stem of the Oregon Trail. They joined the Columbia, west of the Deschutes River, climbed out of the canyon, descended again at the Dalles, took Barlow Road, south side to Mount Hood, and then they took the Columbia route to uh, uh, avoid the winter weather in the Cascades. Immigrants finally ended their journey in the Willamette Valley, where they staked out a plot of land, settled in for a long and brutal winter. Yay, welcome. It's winter. When immigrants finally reached the West, they cleared rocks, cut trees to build new homes, and they better do that shit quick because, uh, again, winter. Uh, the first winter was the ultimate test of survival. When spring arrived, they could utilize the forest, rich soil, wild game in Oregon. If they went to California, there was a you know, better climate for agriculture. Western settlements slowly but surely turned into towns as more people arrived. Gold being found out, you know, west early into the trail's existence helped a lot of towns get, get moving. Uh, what would a typical day like be on the trail? Well, it would start around 4 a.m., real early. Not going to waste any time of the day, uh, you know, to be moving. You want to get moving as fast as possible. They would play a, a bugle or, or the leader of the wagon train would fire his rifle to wake everybody up. Sounds like a terrible start to a terrible day. 5 a.m. By that time, the women have prepared breakfast. The men have rounded up the animals from the grazing fields. They tended to grab breakfast first so they could do some work. By 6 a.m., the men and boys have moved on from breakfast to hitching the wagons while the women and children eat breakfast. 
Breakfast might consist of coffee, bacon, and bread. That sounds good, actually. Better than a heart attack. 7 a.m., the bugle sounds, uh, the wagon master shouts, wagons roll, and everyone's headed out for the day by 7 a.m. By 7 a.m., these pioneers have accomplished a lot more in a typical day than a lot of my uh, fellow stand-up comic friends uh, I work with have accomplished by noon. <laughs> at some point in the day, most wagon trains took an hour lunch called nooning. Wasn't always at noon. Lunch was most often coffee, beans, bacon, or some buffalo meat. Mmm, lean and delicious. Or hardtack if you're a terrible hunter and or too poor to properly supply it before you start your journey. 6 p.m. in a large wagon train, the wagons often circled up to provide a corral for livestock and protect them from cattle thieves, wild animals, and weather. After the wagons circled up, immigrants started fires, cooked dinner, uh, ate venison, buffalo, beef, wild birds if they had it, or leftovers, you know, if they had uh, from the previous day, they'd, you know, have stew. Uh, fat drippings mixed with flour to make gravy. If the immigrants were really desperate for food, they ate snakes or prairie dogs or hardtack. Well, that's a, that's a tough meal. That's, that's how you know you got some poor folks. If you're like, snake and hardtack again. Uh, if a family had a milk cow, they'd churn butter all day using the swaying motion of the wagon. If there was no wood, immigrants made fires using those buffalo chips. Uh, when the immigrants had a moment of free time, like to play music, card games, checkers, or chess. And I imagine probably bitch a lot about how their feet and back hurt. Uh, women would mend clothes. Men would fix the wagons. Men and women wrote in journals, wrote letters back home. Not well for the most part, but they did write them. Uh, roughly one in every 200 immigrants kept diaries of their journey according to one source. Diary time very limited, though. Immigrants only had about an hour each day, max, to write. And they were tired. Some people only wrote on laundry day or when they stopped at forts. That was also the most common way to post letters back home. Take forever to get there, but you could, you know, send them. Let's read a few entries right after I hop back on the Oregon Trail game and try and uh, make it a little further on down the line. Gonna, gonna continue. Oh, I, better hunt, I better hunt. I think, I think we're out of food. Uh, hunt for some food while Lucifina gets well, mended. Oh, bear. God, I killed a bear right off the bat. Oh, dear. Oh, son of a bitch. He's a crafty bastard. And he ran away from me. He just kind of snuck in there. It'd be better if I had more kind of arrow keys. <laughs> I could do more than just be a weird guy who only goes forward, backward, left or right, just directly. Oh, come on, deer. Got another deer. That's good. I want to call it a day. I'm not going to waste any more ammo because no matter how many animals you shoot in the old Oregon Trail game, you only get to pack out 100 pounds of meat, which I think is very unfair. Yep. I got 198 pounds, but it can only bring 100 pounds back. Now we got to rest. We got to let Lucifina fucking not die. Five days. Okay. Now we're into August. We're, we're cooking along though. We're doing pretty good. We're going to continue down the trail. Got, oh, not much food. Shit. God damn it. You guys are eating too much food. I got no food. Fuck. Now people are going to start dying. I got to hunt again real quick. And then after this, we're probably just going to, probably just going to die. I got, I'm going to use all of my money to buy more food. And then it's going to be trading for food. Because hunting, it's just, you don't get enough. Come on, bear. You son of a bitch. He's hiding behind some brush. Oh, dear. Oh, I didn't get him. This is a very unsuccessful trip. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour a spot. Dang it. Oh, I just got a squirrel. Sweet. That's going to be two pounds. <laughs> That's not going to do anything. Damn it. No. Oh, God. I got one pound of meat. I got a fucking skinny squirrel. Is all I got. That sucks. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna try one more time, you guys. I know this is I know this is probably painful to listen to, but please let our please let our wagon train have a chance. And they got me behind, they got me in between two fucking bushes. There's this is a death wish. This is how we all die. I got cocky early on. I thought I could make it with, you know, without doing much of anything. And then I ran out of our food. I realized I got low on money. And now we're dead. Now we're all gonna be dead here soon. Damn it. There's no fucking animals coming around. Probably low on bullets. It's just an idiot with no food. You're unable to shoot any food. I know I, I know I was. Can I try to t can I trade? Can I trade with anybody? Now uh, you meet another immigrant who wants a wagon tongue. He'll give you 60 bullets. Fuck that guy. I can't hunt. Uh I'll, I'll trade with another person. Um, no one wants to trade with you. Okay, just wasting time. Sweet. He wants a wagon axle. Nope. I need food, you idiots. You guys know I need food. No one wants to trade with you. This is, oh, we're getting hungrier and hungrier. Fuck. We're definitely going to die. Okay. Health is poor. Oh, what? A native guy just helped me find food out of nowhere. He, some dude just came by and gave us 30 pounds of food. I didn't even know that could happen in the game. That's awesome. Now we're in heavy fog, though. Oh, man. 
but we got food. It's another guy, another tribe guy, just fucking gave us food. Another 30 pounds of food. I made it to Fort Bo- Boise. Would you like to look around? We're going to take a, a quick break here, but yes, yes, I would. <laughs> okay. Gonna have to buy some food here. When we get back after reading these letters. Let's read these journal entries. I tried to find again exciting entries, but for the most part, they're light on details, sad, and heavy on complaints. But we'll, you know, have, we'll have fun with a, with a few of them. August 1st, 1847. Williams family broke an axle two days from Fort Bridger. Lost a full day waiting for him. Weather's hot. Martin baby died of fever. August 23rd, 1847. Williams family lost an ox. Down to one now. Feet hurt. Sores on back smell funny. Martin family lost another baby. Crossing river. I'll never eat hardtack again once I make it to Oregon. September 10th, 1847. Williams family is completely dead. Feet are swollen, bleeding. Back gangrenous. <laughs> Martin family down to the last baby. Would happily kill that baby for one pound of hardtack. So hungry. Fuck Oregon. Okay, maybe, maybe that wasn't a real one. I wish I could have found journal entries that I found that interesting. I made those ones up. Here's a pair, pair of uh, real entries. And this, this just, they do show how fucking just terrible it was. This is from Clara Rye, September 1846. Five months have passed since we left. There's been a lot of sickness, loss, and death. We are in Devil's Flat. Ten days ago, we filled our barrels, and now they are almost empty. Livestock is thin and sick. James Wright lost a child and saved one. I feel sad for them, and it's steaming hot. I feel like a desert. I expect to get sick going through Devil's Flat. I expect to encounter some more Indians. It's been between 95 and 100 degrees in the day, making it almost impossible to pass. Sooner or later, my mules might die. I hope not. This is a long, dangerous, and hot trip. Uh, Damn, I've had some rough rough road trips, but nothing like Claire's. She did make it to Oregon, but it sounds like barely. Okay, just one more. Anna Ives, also from 1846. September 2nd, we arrived at Devil's Flat. It's been five months since we left Fort Independence. We had some bad stuff like my other ox died. I have no livestock left. One of the good things is that we crossed the river. Also, Pearl's daughter died. (laughs) She says that is terrible. I think so too. When I looked at the dry, deserted Devil's Flat, it did look like a devil, wicked and mean, trying to take our lives. I felt like something bad was going to happen to my children, to my friends on the wagon train. We might fall into the tracks of the evil devil. I hope we don't. Anna. Anna sounds fucking crazy. I, I think so, too, regarding someone's uh, daughter dying. Yeah, Anna. Yeah, it goes without, saying, that goes without saying that's fucking terrible. It's weird that you felt the need to be like, I also think that's terrible that her daughter died. Uh, we might fall into the, the cracks of the evil devil. I, I think you should be more worried about your oxen all being dead. You know, if you were playing the Oregon Trail game, no oxen, you'd be stuck. Unless some asshole is willing to make a, a trade with you. Uh, Anna made it west as well. Uh, this all sounds, yeah, terrible though. Anna and Clara both took trips uh, worse than any road trip I've ever taken for sure. I, f- I feel like a modern day, like a, like a bad trip journal entry from, from my travels would be more like this. September 4th, 2004. Drove from Spokane, Washington to Butte, Montana today looking for uh, for a bar gig. Snow was heavy. Coming over Lookout Pass, slippery in the Hyundai. Glad I brought some extra CDs. <laughs> FM signals are non-existent. New Modest Mouse and My Chemical Romance albums are legit. Got a little hungry after I stopped at the St. Regis truck stop. Should have grabbed those old-fashioned donuts when I gassed up. Taco John's was a bad call for lunch. Fake cheese and tater tots don't belong in a burrito. Did some damage to a gas station bathroom in Deer Lodge. Might stop in to apologize on my way back to Spokane tomorrow. Show not fun. Seven people in crowd, three paying attention, one maybe didn't hate me. Opening act was a juggler. Considering driving off the road on the way back, but Honda won't go fast enough to take me out. Hungry for Taco John's again. Okay. Gonna go over a bit more of what settlers did on the trail again right after I see if I can take my wagon party all the way to the Blue Mountains. Or further. Let's, uh, let's, let's, buy, some, let's buy some supplies. Let's use the last of our money. Okay, we have 42 bucks left. God damn it, food's 45 cents a pound. I don't even know how much that gets me. 90 pounds, maybe? I'm gonna try and get 90 pounds of food and we're gonna see what that does. 90 pounds of, come on. I have $2 left. Nope, I gotta get out of here. I gotta leave the store. 
Let's go. Attempt to trade. Yes, I would like to trade. No one wants to trade with you. Jesus Christ, the people hate me. Luckily, there's a couple of tribe members that fucking give me stuff. Everyone else is dicks. Let's continue on the trail. Six, 160 miles to the Blue Mountains. Okay, Let's see if I can make it. Oh, heavy fog. Lost today. God damn it. The health is poor for the team. It's hot. We got 45 pounds left of food. It's a rough trail now on top of everything. We got 30 pounds left of food. Inadequate grass. Oh, God. Heavy fog. We have zero pounds of food already. Little water. Health is poor. People are dying. We have 106 miles to the next landmark. I got to fucking hunt again. We're all dead. Come on, we're in the desert. Please don't. Oh, oh, that's interesting. I'm in the desert surrounded by brush. It won't let me shoot anywhere. This game's trying to kill us now. Literally can't shoot more than maybe two feet next to me. All right. Well, we're dead. We're dead. We're dead. Little J, burger, showbiz. I'm sorry I did this to you. We can't hunt. No one wants to trade with us. I'm stuck behind three piles of sagebrush as I watch many deer just go right on the other side. My guy's too fucking dumb to be able to just walk maybe two feet to the left. Just try and take one shot. Somebody, I got I to gotta attempt to trade now or we're all, our whole team's going to die. No one wants to trade with us. That's great. We have so much stuff too. We have cool, yes. Oh, he, 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 oh, he wants 58 pounds of my food. Damn it, I got excited. Fuck you. I have no food. You want 58 pounds? Why are you trying to trade with me? Oh, he, he wants my ox. He'll trade me 52 pounds of food. Yes, I'm willing to trade. Take my, that sounds like a, you stole from me, but whatever. Now we have, wait a minute. I got I to size up my rations. I got to change my food rations. Got to hit number five. We're down to bare bones. Sorry, team. Some of you are going to die. And now we got to, now we got to hit the trail. And we took the wrong fucking trail. And we lost four days. The health is poor. We're a long ways from anywhere cool. We got 12 pounds in mega rations. Inadequate dra- grass. Oh man, we've made it 1,700 miles. We're about to die in the home stretch. God, we're at the Blue Mountains. Would you like to look around? Yes, I would. <laughs> September 19th, 1848, looking around the Blue Mountains, and so close to death. Press spacebar to continue. Uh, Going to attempt to trade before we move on. Nope, can't do it. Just need food, people. Come on, food or nothing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and hunt one more time. I know this is painful, but we're going to do one more hunting. Oh, it doesn't even let me hunt. What's your choice? Why, why can't I hunt? Yeah, oh, I got to make a choice. Head for Fort Walla Walla? Fuck yeah. Not the Dalles. We don't have, we have to get, I have no money. I've killed us. No. Oh, health is poor. It's hot out. There's bad water. I can't believe none of us have starved to death. We've been for about a week now with literally no food. Would you like to look around? Yes. All right. Some friendly looking people this fort. Now I have to try and trade because we have, we're begging. I wish there was a beg option. Somebody wants to trade me 40 bullets? No. Please trade. Give me some food. He wants, oh, he'll trade me 25 pounds of food for a wagon axle. That seems like he's ripped me off, but I'll take it. We're desperate. All right. And we're going to stay there for a little bit. And then we're going to come back and our whole team's going to die. Uh, let's see what children on the trail were up to. When they had time and the wagon wasn't moving, the children played games like button, button. Who's got the button? Or drop the handkerchief. Both these games don't sound real fun. Uh, well, drop the handkerchief, I guess. It's a game where one player runs behind the other players as they stand in a circle. Drops a handkerchief behind one of them. Must then pick it up and then run after, run the circle after the first player. Try to try to tag, catch, or kiss him. Oh boy, must have been playing that with mom, pa. We're looking. Button, button. Who's got the button? They all form a circle, and uh, you know, one kid called the leader or it takes an object like a button, goes around the circle. Everybody else has their eyes closed, hands out, or no, I'm sorry, doesn't have their eyes closed, hands out, and then has to fake where the button's going. You know, they kind of like try and sneak and act like they have the button, and then you have to guess who who's the button. Now, all the leader or the kids, they say, button, button, who's got the button? And each kid guesses. And then the guest who replies, you know, Billy's got the button, or I don't know. Doesn't sound like a very fun game. Uh, children, some of them, they would study when they could. They would usually complete school lessons in the evenings. Uh, some party stopped on Sundays to have church service. Some would stop for a little bit of laundry. Uh, women on the trails, uh, they would do a lot of stuff. They challenged traditional gender roles. Hail Lucifina. They often travel with their husbands and children. Uh, played a key role in the success of the wagon trains. Normally, they did all the domestic work, cooking, cleaning, raising children, uh, also physical labor, gathered fuel, drove oxen, made bullets, acted as nurses and doctors, gave birth, kept traveling, working, occasionally infant orphans, shared amongst uh, nursing mothers so they could survive the journey. Damn. 
Um, and then some women did everything because they would travel without men. The Homestead Act was revolutionary for women because they were allowed to claim property for themselves. It stated any person who's the head of the family or who's arrived at the age of 21 years eligible. Women who were single, widowed, or divorced could be considered the head of the family. Historians estimate that women accounted for one-third of homestead claims in the first 50 years of the act. Uh, women out there driving those mule and oxen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mule teams, preferred mode of travel. Oxen, more common. Both animals uh, were some of the only livestock strong enough to pull heavy wagons. Wagons constructed of seasoned hardwood, they could carry up to 2,500 pounds. Typical wagon, 10 feet, 4 by 4 feet. Uh, they had to be extra tough to survive the rough terrain, mostly made out of uh, Osage orange wood or white oak. Wagon typically cost 85 bucks, about 3,000 today. Covered about 100 bucks, about 3,500 today. Covered wagon was the main mode of transport, the minivan of immigrant trails. There was a few different types. There was the Murphy wagon, named for Joseph Murphy. Murphy produced wagons for traders headed west from Missouri to Santa Fe and later for overland immigrants. His wagons were the best. Nine feet tall, 12 foot long, straight box bed. Could haul up to 2,200 pounds. Uh, but if you went too far above uh, that, you might, you know, damage the wagon beyond repair. And it required two yokes of oxen. Spare oxen, uh, you know, often traveled behind so the families could rotate and give their livestock a break. Next, the Studebaker wagon. Named for the Studebaker brothers. Started their business in South Bend, Indiana. Founded in 1852. The company would eventually make cars as well uh, as up until 1966. Studebakers also provided hardware for many of the earliest wagon manufacturers. Almost every wagon of every brand had Studebaker components. Finally, there was the uh, Con 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 Conestoga. There we go. I wanted to add a syllable there. The Conestoga wagon. That's the one usually seen in Western films. It's a covered wagon named for its origins in uh, Conestoga River Valley. In Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, 17 feet long, 11 feet high. Bigger for freighters moving supplies west. It could haul up to 6,000 pounds, but needed 16 oxen to pull it. Wagon covers often made of canvas cloth, sailcloth, homespun hemp. Having a sturdy cover essential to success on the trail. And then the final method of transport, the Mormon handcart. It was for poor people making the journey west. You had to push or pull that shit the entire fucking way. Gosh dang, now flipping chat behind me. Sounds terrible, like you're being tortured. Pulling, pushing your shit for up to 2,100 miles. And change. Hard pass. I'll just die back east, thanks. Uh, modeled after carts used by street sweepers, or luggage trolleys, and railroad uh, porters. Three feet wide, four feet long, nine inch deep box. Carry a few hundred pounds just walking down the trail. Ugh, and they broke a lot too. Uh, and even if you did have a wagon that people would ride on, you usually walked. It was a lot of walking. Immigrants really took time off to celebrate. People did have weddings, birthdays. A lot of women gave birth while traveling. Fourth of July, commonly celebrated. Makes sense. Uh, not going to be Christmas. If you're still on the trail at the end of December, you're, you know, about to die. Independence Day, men fired salutes with their guns, waved flags. Wagon parties stopped to have a feast occasionally. Immigrant Amos Bachelder wrote in 1849, Soon after we started this morning, we passed a large company in camp. We salu they saluted us with several volleys of musketry. They were returned in a scattering fashion from our train, which extended nearly a mile. They had the stars and stripes moving in the breeze and were stopping to celebrate that day. Uh, another reason to celebrate on July 4th was reaching Independence Rock, Wyoming. If the settlers reached Independence Rock by July 4th, it meant they were on schedule. Settlers liked to carve their names into the landmark to mark their journey west. It became known as the Great Register of the Desert. Also been called the birthplace of American graffiti. Uh, to this day, you can visit the rock and see settlers' names written on it. It's very cool. Big rock, 130 feet high, 1,900 feet long, 850 feet wide, a U.S. national landmark. And to my knowledge, not even one example of was here being scratched out and changed to sucks dick, which is impressive. Uh, weddings fairly common on jumping off spots like the Platte River or Fort Laramie. Nothing like getting hitched on a long and dusty trail. I'm sure those wedding night festivities smelled fantastic. Lucifina just threw up in her mouth. Romances often were sparked up between people in different families on the wagon parties. Oftentimes, if a couple got married on the trail or at a fort, older married couples conspired against the newlyweds with chivalry. Never heard of this. People circled around the couple, fired guns, banged pots, and made as much noise as possible so they wouldn't get a, a wink of privacy on their wedding night. It was a fun way to haze a new couple and a source of entertainment for everyone but the couple. I actually thought for a second that the lead researcher on this suck, Olivia Lee, had come and slaughtered me with that bullshit bit of trivia, but it's, it's true. Chivalry. Uh, those settlers came up with some interesting ways to keep themselves entertained. Uh, immigrants faced many dangers on the trail from accidents, disease, extreme weather conditions, and attacks from local tribes. Not that common as a lot of Western movies and TV shows tried to make it out to be. Majority of tribes were peaceful. Myths and rumors about tribes did lead to more violence with tribes. 
uh, you know, because uh, the people would attack them, being worried about them. They'd shoot first, ask questions later. After settlers had been settling for a few decades, uh, and after they'd killed most of the buffalo in some places, stripped the land of a lot of other resources, then some tribes did get pretty hostile and attack, which makes sense. Somebody comes into your neighborhood, fucks everything up. You know, it's going to be hard to be neighborly after that. Conflicts with other immigrants was also a danger. Disease, the biggest danger, as I said, especially cholera. Puking and shitting yourself to death. Blowing up that, you know, poop hole cap. Blowing it right off with McGill's pop. Cholera outbreaks struck each spring as jumping off towns along the Missouri River. Thousands of families preparing to set out gathered in towns to get supplies for the trip. Many people died from cholera before they even set out on the trail. How terrible for them and their families. Starting off mourning. Uh, many more died along the trail corridor to Fort Laramie, Wyoming. Cholera, uh, as, we, as I've explained before, does not actually blow up your butthole, but you do shit yourself to death. Severe diarrhea kills people through dehydration. The bacteria spreads to water and food contaminated by human waste, treated today, you know, by rehydrating the patient. At the time, though, proper treatments unknown. Uh, typical treatments were camphor and laudanum. Camphor, a powder that originally came from the bark and wood of the camphor tree, didn't do anything to treat cholera. Neither did laudanum, an opiate related to morphine and heroin. Taking too much laudanum. Whiskey, laudanum, saw. Uh, did somewhat frequently lead to fatal overdoses, though. You could choke down a bunch of liquid morphine to treat your horrific diarrhea, and then you'd OD which I guess was less painful than shitting yourself to death. Most people would die of cholera within a few hours. If you didn't die within 12 to 24 hours, well, then you had a decent chance of surviving. The unsanitary conditions along the trail, perfect breeding ground for cholera, which spreads quickly uh, in dirty, unsanitary places, you know, places with uh, out hand sanitizers everywhere like we have now, or any kind of soap, you know, or any kind of sinks to wash your hands off after using the bathroom. Just shitting in the woods, no toilet paper, no soap, lots of cholera. Yay, living in the 1800s. Uh, immigrants also unknowingly carried the bacteria with them and deposited it in campgrounds and water holes. Uh, once travelers made it to Fort Laramie, though, usually safe from cholera. One immigrant, George Tribble, wrote about the cholera epidemic in 1852, saying for 400 miles, the road was almost a solid graveyard. At one campground, I counted 71 graves. Damn. Five out of 10 Tribble family members died on the way to Oregon. Most cholera graves unmarked, family members being buried along the trail just where they died. Bison, another danger on the trail. Herds of thousands at one time covering the plains. They could block wagon trains for miles, occasionally charge a wagon train. Dust storms, common problem. Immigrant James John wrote in 1841, there came up a storm in the afternoon. The wind blew very hard and on the opposite side of the river, a tremendous hurricane. We saw trees flying on the air. Water blown on the, out of the river as high as, apparently, as the clouds. Wow, he seems like he exaggerates, but, you know, it's probably bad. Immigrants also had to face thunderstorms. And uh, hailstones, sometimes big enough to sometimes kill people and animals. Lightning, tornadoes, destructive winds. Also, the intense heat of the deserts along the trail made some of the wagon wheels shrink and people have to soak their wheels in the rivers at night to keep them from, you know, breaking, cracking, causing irreparable damage. Immigrants also had to rub axle grease on their lips to prevent blisters. It just keeps sounding more fun. Accidents, another, another main cause of death. People died from accidental gunshots, slipping under wagons, unruly oxen, Drowning, medical complications. Uh, in later trail years, bunching occurred when groups of hundreds, even thousands of wagons would get stuck in a big old wagon traffic jam. And then people get frustrated, try to move too fast, fucking run over toddlers and shit. Tough, tough times to be a toddler on the wagon trail. If immigrants ran out of supplies, couldn't hunt or forage, they also faced starvation. Immigrant Clark Thompson wrote in 1850, look starvation in the face. I've seen men on passing an animal that have starved to death on the plain, stop and cut out a steak. Roast and eat it and call it delicious. Eating some of that sweet, rancid, rotting meat steaks. Right, nice aged meat, no, not cured or preserved in any way, but definitely aged. I think you're supposed to prepare those steaks well done to burn out the maggots. Uh, some of the people went crazy on the trail. One, one notable story is Elizabeth Markham. When her family reached the Snake River in present-day Idaho, she, quote, went insane, told her husband Samuel she wasn't going any farther, left her behind, took the children on towards Oregon country. Short time later, sends his oldest son John back to get her. And then how fucked up is this? When his wife returns alone, Mr. Markham learned that she had clubbed John, to fight, you know, tried to club him to death with a rock, uh, raced to find him. John's barely alive. Then when Mr. Markham and John make it back to the wagon train, he discovers that his wife, Elizabeth, has set one of their fucking wagons on fire. And after all that, they stayed together. Makes me wonder how good the sex was. I know, Mitchum, I know. I reckon I ought to leave her too. She damn near killed my oldest boy, John, set her wagon to flames. But well, <laughs> she fucks like a banshee and she can suck a New York steak through a straw. I can't leave her. Uh, the Markhams had two more kids together. 
They ran a store together for a time in Oregon City after all that, then divorced. And Samuel went to California. She got married again and divorced again. Not a real surprise. All right. About to jump into a baby timeline. Little one about making it to the Oregon Territory. Uh, but first, let's finish out our trail journey here. We're, we're definitely about to die here. Okay, we're going to attempt to trade. We've got a lot of stuff to trade, but no one wants to fucking trade with us. Oh, boy. Let's just continue on the trail. Can we make it 120 miles with no food? No, oh, we have 20 pounds of food. All right. At least, Lucifina, you have measles. I'm so sorry, but we have to keep moving. We have, we have 15 pounds of food. Good luck starving with measles. We're down to five pounds. Of, now we're down to zero <laughs> pounds of food in a very little water. All right, got to try hunting one last time or trading with somebody. Come on. Uh, come on. Trade with us. Please, someone give us food. Nope. Food is just scarce now. This is not good. Oh, no. Uh, damn it. I thought he, he wanted food too. Everybody's starving on the trail now. No one wants to trade with us. We're getting hungrier and hungrier. Oh, boy. Nope. Got to try hunting one last time. This is it. This is it. And then I'm just going to die. Okay. And they stuck me behind a fucking tree again. This is fantastic. This is great. And my guy is a moron and he just, Oh, I can shoot a tree in that direction or a tree in the other direction. This is super fun. Oh, wait, come on, bear, bear. Okay. We got a bear. We got a bear. I'm just going to, I'm just going to stop there. Right. There's no way I can get all that meat out anyway. Sorry for the drink of water there. Getting thirsty on the trail. I haven't eaten, in, I don't know, seven days or something. And now Lucifina has measles. I'm probably, you know, it's probably frustrating listening to her complain. Now we're gonna try and make it on down the trail. We got 100 pounds of meat. Let's fucking go. Come on. Burgers has measles now too. The measles is spreading. God damn it. Lucifina and burgers. Both have measles. And the water's bad. Now Lil J has measles. Oh God. And oh, we just lost, oh, eight days. Oh, Lucifina has cholera now. Shit's getting real fucking rough. Oh, we just lost another eight days. Oh, God. Uh, the trail's real bad. Oh, come on. Come on. No one died yet, though. Heavy fog. Inadequate grass. You're now at the Dallas. Would you like to look around? You bet. Hey, we got the water. Okay. And then we got to continue on the trail because we're dying. Okay, float down the Columbia River or take the Barlow Toll Road. You know what? We're going to float down the river. We're going to gamble it. Use the arrow keys to guide your raft to the rushing waters of the Columbia River. Can we all make it after passing a third direction sign? Land your raft at the at the trail to make it. We might make it after all that. So dramatic. Oh boy. No. Oh God. This is really hard. It's not working. No, no, no. Oh no. The raft hit a rock. This game just fucked me. The keys aren't working. Little J, I'm sorry. You're dead. Oh boy. Showbiz, you're dead. Lucifina, you're dead. <laughs> we lost four oxen, seven sets of clothing, 17 bullets, wagon axles. Okay, we lost pretty much everything. But the, all right, now my wagon's heading down. How do I, oh, I was pushing the wrong way. Haha, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> uh, I might still make it. I think it's me. I think little J, I think it's me and little J. Just together, just the two of us. Just like an we done. Oh no, the button just fucked me again. No, it's burgers is dead now. Oh God. <laughs> Still floating. Oh, no. <laughs> we need another rock. How are we still alive? Okay. All right. Oh, God. We hit the bank. I'm a terrible raft guy. Okay. Making it a little further. Me and I think, I think little Jay is still alive on the old Apple IIe Oregon Trail game. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. I, now I'm getting, now I'm a better river guide. You have to do a little more work when you play this game. Like it just keeps moving after you hit the button. I didn't know that before. I'm sure this is amazing audio content, but we're so close. I can't stop. Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, we, me and little Jay, I think we're going to make it. I don't see any, come on. How long is this? this? They didn't make games as well back then, right? There's no reason for it to slowly go on this long. The graphics are shitty. Come on. Or I do remember playing this game all the time, trying to like get out of things in school. I had one teacher, third grade, who let me play it all the time. Miss Williamson. I remember getting out of stuff. I was like, no, come on. I'm almost, I got to make it down a little further down the, the river. And I remember this one kid, Thomas Jefferson. He was the best at it. He could win with all three of the things. He could be a banker. He could be a carpenter. He could be whatever other dipshit there was. Okay. Uh, you know what? 
I'm just, I'm just going to go ahead and hit the timeline button because this is taking a while. We'll find out here in a second if I made it. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. All right, I'm going to try and multitask. Uh, the RAF has missed the landing. You have lost two sets of clothing. I didn't even know there was a landing. We made it! We made it! Uh, October 23rd, 1848. Congratulations, you've made it to Oregon. Let's see how many points you received. <laughs> it was just me. I think little Jay, he died, I guess. Oh, so sorry. One person in very poor health. Was that me? That's just me. Joe said, it's just me. For me. For going as a carpenter, your points doubled. And I had I made it with my wagon. I made it with a uh, person in poor health and literally nothing else. No, I had 29 bullets. Everything else was lost in the river. Like literally everything else. Okay. So I got 500 points. And I'm a little bit shy of the top score in this game, which is Stephen Meek with 7,650 points. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, that game's over now. So we did some stuff. Now we're in the timeline. 1542. Sorry, everybody. Sorry, team. Everybody's dead. But I, I lived. That's pretty cool. 1542 explorer Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo sailed to the coast of California, mapping the shoreline and naming landmarks. He died on Catalina Island from complications of a broken limb. It's a pretty island, at least, to die on. His chief pilot, Bartolome Ferrer, took control of the ship, sailed north, possibly reaching Oregon's coast. The French and Spanish were the first to explore Oregon in the 17th and 18th centuries before Europeans arrived. You know, uh, local tribes lived in Oregon for over 10,000 years. Historians estimate there were around 180,000 people, around 125 tribes at the peak of that. The Chinook lived along the lower Columbia River and the coastal plains between the Cascade Mountains and the Pacific. Also, many others like the Cascade, Clackamas, Multnomah, and the Clatsop, uh, Fort Clatsop and Astoria, Oregon, where Lewis and Clark and their expedition would, you know, winter during their expedition before they headed back east. The banks of the Columbia River were a main trading and fishing spot for indigenous groups all over the northwestern U.S. and southwestern Canada. Areas around major rivers were almost as uh, always important trading centers, especially during salmon runs. Beautiful part of the country. Early 1600s, explorers began searching for what they called the River of the West. Explorer Martin de Aguilar uh, first reported it. He thought it was a major river running in the Pacific near the 42nd parallel. Map makers began calling the river the Northwest Passage. We now know that, that it wasn't. Uh, in 1765, British Major Robert Rogers, Rob Rogers, Rob Rog, called the River of the West the River Oregon, like our Oregon, French word for hurricane or windstorm. Spelled uh, Oregon later by Jonathan Carver in 1778. And the misspelled name stuck. That's how Oregon got its name, I think. There's a lot of disagreement of how the name Oregon came to be, but that seems to me the best story. Uh, it does get real windy on parts of the Columbia. March of 1778, English explorer James Cook sighted the coast of Oregon. Uh, he established a fort on Vancouver Island, spent time trading with local tribes. Numerous explorers now spreading the word about how the there's great fur trading potential in the Pacific Northwest, and that reaches uh, all the way to Thomas Jefferson, U.S. minister to France at the time. He remembers. 1787, uh, American captains Robert Gray and John Kendrick sent to the Pacific Coast to trade with tribes in the area, reach Oregon 10 months later, and uh, you know do their trading. Gray returned to Boston in 1790, making him the first American to circumnavigate the globe. 1792, two of the first white men to reach the Columbia River Gorge at the end of the Oregon Trail are Robert Gray and George Vancouver. Sent by American Britain, respectively. Both explorers entered the river from the Pacific Ocean. Gray sailed from Boston to the Pacific Northwest on September 28, 1790, on a ship called the Columbia. This party camped north of the Nootka Sound on Vancouver Island for the winter of 1791-1792. Gray showed up in April of 1792. His party would name all sorts of shit in the area that stuck to this day. Vancouver Island, Mount Baker, Mount Adams, Puget Sound, Mount Rainier, Whidbey Island, and much more all named after crew members, himself, or friends. Gray's party left after trading with the Chinook people near the mouth of the river. On May 11, 1792, the Columbia crossed a sandbar at the mouth of the Columbia and uh, the mouth of Columbia River and explored the waterway. Gray saw natives on the, on the bank following his ship. He wrote, without a doubt, we are the first civilized people that ever visited this port. These poor fellows viewed us and the ship with the greatest astonishment. Their language was different from any we have yet heard. The men were entirely naked. And the women, except a small apron before, were also in a state of nature. The crew exchanged gifts uh, with them and probably tried to hide their boners and not zone off staring at boobs or, you know, not get caught trying to see up those aprons. And they established fur trade. 
The Columbia returned home on uh, July, uh, excuse me, July 25th, 1793. Before he left, Gray named the River Columbia, you know, after the ship. Gray in Vancouver often cited as the first to discover the territory. Actually, though, just two of 28 trading vessels in the Northwest that year. Not to mention, you know, of course, the tribes already living in the heart of Oregon country. On April 27th, 1792, Gray and Vancouver meet up, compare maps. They both note the location of the Columbia River. And uh, Vancouver dismissed Gray as an amateur, said it was not a major river. Obviously, he was a bit wrong there. 1805, Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery reached the Columbia River Gorge, first U.S. military personnel to reach the area. 1810, fur entrepreneur John Jacob Astor organizes an expedition west to establish a fur trading post for America Fur Company in Oregon. They follow the Missouri River upstream from St. Louis to South Dakota, then trek across Wyoming and Idaho, meet another group that sailed west along the river there. 1811, British merchant David Thompson navigated the Columbia from its headwaters in British Columbia to the river's mouth. His party encountered Fort Astoria, recently established by John Jacob Astor's, you know, Pacific Fur Company. Both companies traveled upstream together, relying on local tribes for help and resources. From 1811 to 1840, the trail is used by trappers, fur traders, missionaries, traveling mostly on foot and horseback. Uh, their journeys probably sucked more than the uh, early journeys of the Oregon Trail settlers. 1812, John Jacob Astor completes Fort Astoria near the mouth of the Columbia River. That was the first American-owned settlement on the Pacific coast. Astor sent Robert Stewart and other party members back east for supplies and men. They found the South Pass in southwestern Wyoming, a 20-mile gap in the Rockies that provides a path across the Continental Divide. On December 24, 1814, U.S., Britain, uh, they signed the Treaty of Ghent, officially ending the War of 1812. Four British-American commissions tasked with resolving boundary questions now. That'll influence the shape of the West. 1821, the British Hudson's Bay Company purchases the Northwest Fur Company, takes ownership of former Fort Astoria. Uh-oh, better get out there and settle that shit before the British do. Manifest destiny. Also in 1824, Jedediah Smith, James Fitzpatrick, become the first U.S. explorers to reach California, coming from the East. 1830s, missionaries began arriving along the Columbia River from the Oregon Trail. March 1st, 1833, the Christian Advocate Journal published an article with the title, Who Will Respond to Go Beyond the Rocky Mountains and Carry the Book of Heaven? Wesleyan University President Wilbur Fisk asked the Methodist Mission Board to establish a mission among the Flathead tribe. Asked his pupil, Reverend Jason Lee, to lead a caravan to Oregon. Lee accepts, and a young fur trader named Nathaniel Wyeth agrees to lead the group to the annual fur trader rendezvous in Wyoming. April 28, 1834, missionaries Jason and Daniel Lee depart for Oregon, led by Wyeth and Captain William Sublett. They reach Pocatello, Idaho. Lee delivers the first Protestant sermon in Oregon country. When they reach the Snake River, Wyeth established Fort Hall near Pocatello. His post later purchased by the Hudson's Bay Company, and it becomes a major supply outpost for future immigrants. Wyeth Lee Party, the first group to travel the entire Oregon Trail. Jason Lee set up a Methodist mission in the Willamette Valley. Daniel Lee established a mission at the Dalles. 1836, missionary Marcus Whitman leads an Overland Party by wagon to the west. He and his wife Narcissa, along with the Reverend Henry Spaulding and his wife Eliza and William Gray, found a mission in present-day Walla Walla, Washington, in an effort to convert local tribes to Christianity. The journey proved to American society at the time that women could survive an inland journey to the Northwest. 1840, Robert Newell and Joseph Meek, leading a small party from Fort Hall, guided by Thomas Fitzpatrick, are often credited as the first non-missionary immigrants, regular old-ass settlers, to reach Willamette Valley by land. 1841, the first proper wagon train crosses the Oregon Trail. Small band of 70 immigrants leaves from Independence, Missouri, led by John Barlson and John Bidwell. Bidwell, eventually thousands of wagons, will widen the the path into a 100-foot-wide highway of sorts. 1842, a group of 100 immigrants crossed the Oregon Trail on the second major journey, led by missionary Elijah White. Same year, Marcus Whitman, he's back, travels 3,000 miles back east on horseback alone. It's fucking insane. To persuade sponsors to continue missions and plead with President John Tyler to keep the territory out of Great Britain's hands. Apparently, Tyler was thinking about exchanging all that land for a cod fishery, but Whitman changed his mind. His actions, along with reports from mapmaker and explorer John C. Fremont, who explored the West with Kit Carson and Thomas Fitzpatrick, helped dispel some myths floating around at the time that there was nothing but a bunch of desert out there and it wasn't worth settling. 1843, before Oregon becomes a territory, new overlanders arrive and form a provisional government that bans slavery, yay, but bars entry to black people, not yay. Their law required enslavers to free enslaved people. They brought with them to Oregon and then banished freed black people from the territory. Many black people who tried to stay were whipped, lashed uh, 39 times. For every six months, they remained in Oregon. What the fuck? John, you and your family are free. We will not tolerate slavery in this new land. It's immoral. Now, please enjoy your new freedom and get the fuck out. Go on. Go be free somewhere else, you son of a bitch. We're a crazy-ass species. 
Settlers later amended the lash law to forced labor. So you were no longer a slave. That's against the law. But then if you didn't leave, you were basically made to be a slave. So they didn't really abolish slavery. Uh, despite all this horseshit, some of the original pioneers were black. A few hundred black people traveled your, to the Oregon Territory in the 1840s and 50s and 60s, despite white settlers not welcoming them with open arms. One notable black immigrant was George Bush, free son of a black father and an Irish mother. He traveled to Oregon in 1844 with his wife and five children, wanted to escape the hostile state of Missouri for a fresh start. Joined up with a wagon party of four white families. These whites respected Bush because they were neighbors in Missouri. George was described as a prosperous farmer and a kind man. They gave supplies to the poorer families in the party, bought food for them along the trail. When they reached the Dalles, they got word of Oregon's lash law, though. Bush and his family then headed up to the Hudson's Bay Company territory north of the Columbia River, out of reach of Oregon's exclusion laws. Wintered near Hudson's Bay, uh, Hudson's Bay Company's Fort Vancouver, present-day Washington State. In the spring, they moved further north to get away from crazy, lash-happy white folk, settled in the Puget Sound area near present-day Tumwater about 60 miles south of present-day Seattle, built a farm, became friends with local Nisqually tribe. Then, when the U.S. and Britain divided the Oregon country in 1846, U.S. took over the Puget Sound region, Bush again subject to racist laws. Motherfucker! Congress passed the Donation Land Act of 1850, which allowed white settlers to legally claim land in Oregon. He was at risk of losing his farm. Luckily, Bush's friends and neighbors took legal action to help him protect his land, and then Congress passed an act in 1855 to validate Bush's land claim. And by 1860, the Bushes had a modern mechanized farm known as uh, Bush Prairie. His direct descendants would remain in the area and prosper, and I have to imagine he still has descendants in the Puget Sound area to this day. The rare success story for black Americans who took the trail. May 22nd, 1843, a thousand immigrants all head west together as part of the Great Migration of 1843. Led by John Gant, a former army captain and fur trader. First large wagon train to cross the trail, they departed from Elm Grove, Missouri. Great Migration eventually joined, partially guided by old Marcus Whitman again. The entire journey took five months for the massive wagon train, except for one guy who uh, apparently, according to one source I found, made the entire journey in around 30 minutes. Rumor has it, Willie Hitchenbacher, while preparing for his 1843 journey, while trying to make moonshine, accidentally added a whole heap of nitroglycerin to his still and stumbled upon an early batch of fucking Whipple, Oregon Trail Pioneer Edition. Made out of two gallons of nitroglycerin, four gallons of moonshine, full batch of Whipple! Oregon Trail Pioneer Edition allows you to run roughly 4,000 miles an hour for around 30 minutes. You can run across water, through trees, bison you hit are obliterated. You can even slow or speed down the rotation of the fucking earth, depending on which way you temporarily unbreakable body is zipping along. Fuck you, fuck your family, fuck your wagon train, and drink Whipple! Sadly, uh, Willie Hitchenbacher died of a massive heart attack and internal hemorrhaging shortly after making it to Oregon City. And maybe Willie's not real. I can't remember. 1845, 3,000 people participated in that year's Great Migration. It became an annual event, uh, but the giant convoy soon turned into smaller bands of wagons 12 to 24 in a party. 1846, a group of Mormon immigrants decided to move to the Great Salt Lake region after Mormon leader Joseph Smith murdered in 1844. They crossed to Iowa, set up a winter camp in Nebraska, and traveled the rest of the trail before breaking off west, heading into Utah. We covered that a bit more in episode 157 on Mormonism. Same year, John McLaughlin opens a general store in Oregon City. Now considered the final stop on the trail, Barlow Road identified, eliminating the need to cross the Columbia River. 1847, the Whitman family and 11 other whites near Walla Walla are murdered by the Cayuse tribe after a measles outbreak. In the years before, Whitman's focus had shifted to converting as many indigenous people as possible. Uh, but as more and more white settlers arrived to his outpost, the Cayuse had become resentful of him. When a measles outbreak killed many Cayuse, they attacked the settlers in retaliation. The incident would help pass a bill establishing the Oregon Territory so settlers could provi be provided some military protection and cause the Cayuse War between natives and settlers, and that would last until 1855. January 24, 1848, James Wilson Marshall, carpenter from New Jersey, finds gold in the American River at the base of the Sierra Nevada Mountains near Coloma, California. California. Marshall was working to build a water-powered sawmill for John Sutter, founder of the colony of New Switzerland, which later became Sacramento. Days after Marshall made his discovery, the U.S. and Mexico signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, if you recall, making California U.S. territory. Marshall and Sutter tried to keep the news a secret, but word spread, and by mid-March, a newspaper reported the discovery at Sutter's Mill. By mid-June, three-fourths of San Francisco's men left town for gold mines. And there were 4,000 miners in town by August. More soon arrived by boat from Oregon, Hawaii, Mexico, Chile, Peru, and China. Gold, 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 get it, get it, get it! Thousands of uh, prospective miners traveled to San Francisco and the surrounding area. 
By the end of 1849, two years later, the non-native population in California had risen from about 7,000 to around 100,000. December of 1848, gold fever kicked off in the East. When President Polk announced the discovery of gold in California, East Coasters were skeptical before, but now having the president confirm the news made them set their sights on the Oregon Trail. In 1849, thousands of men sold their homes, borrowed money to travel to California. The 49ers made their way overland on the Oregon Trail. The gold rush peaked in 1852, bringing thousands to California. In total, $2 billion worth of precious metal would be extracted from the area. 1850, the Oregon Donation Land Act, small precursor to the Homestead Act, encouraged further settlement in Oregon country. By 1851, the Oregon ter Territory non-native population went from a small group of primarily fur trappers and missionaries to around 12,000 people. December of 1851, gold discovered in Oregon further increases traffic into the territory, and the discovery of gold marks the beginning of the end for the trail. As more and more miners come west, they start to veer off into the traditional path more and more, paving their own way, looking for some sweet, shiny shit. They could be thought of as just another mineral worth no more than some gravel, uh, since currency is a made-up social construct, but instead, it's a shiny symbol of commerce. Yay, arbitrarily picking gold. Yay, shiny stuff. In the mid-1850s, there's a decrease in immigration when the U.S. government removes indigenous groups from their villages along the river. Some tribes are moved with treaties, others forcefully. 1858, businesses like Portage Roads, Railroads, and the Oregon Steam Navigation Company set up along major rivers to make money and help immigrants cross the trail more easily. Ferries and bridges sprang up across river crossings, as well as, you know, more trading posts and forts. Shortens trail time by as much as a month. People now making new businesses, charging money to get across those uh, rivers. On February 4th, 1859, Oregon becomes a state. One of their first state actions is to prohibit further black settlement, those sons of bitches. White people being scared of black people, the American way. Still too much of that today. Uh, black people barred from owning property, entering into contracts, participating in legal matters. This clause will not be repealed until 1926. 1860 and 1862, discovery of gold in Idaho lures settlers into the Snake River Valley. July 1st, 1862, President Lincoln signs the Pacific Railroad Act. The Pacific Railroad Act chartered the Central Pacific and Union Pacific Railroad Companies to build a transcontinental railroad linking the east and west coasts. And this act guaranteed public land grants and loans to each railroad company. Construction began in 1862. For seven years, these companies raced towards each other from Sacramento and Omaha. The road had been slowly but surely catching up the Oregon Trail. In 1850, there were 9,000 miles of track east of the Missouri River. With the influx of settlers moving west, plus the gold rush, railroad companies looking to expand as quickly as possible. Go, gold, gold, gold. 1869, the beginning of the end for the trail. In early 1869, the railroad companies just a few miles away from each other. In March, they agreed to meet each other at the Promontory Summit in Utah to complete the railroad, and on May 10th, the Transcontinental Railroad's completed, bringing the wagon era to a close. The Central Pacific, Union Pacific, meet and promontory, final spike driven into the railroad at the Golden Spike Ceremony. And it made it way easier, right, to get across the, uh, uh, where the Oregon Trail was heading. It used to cost a thousand bucks to cross the country. After the railroad's completion, the price dropped to 111 bucks, then to 80, then to 40 bucks. Crazy difference. The railroad opened the West up to much faster development, Travel time cut from several months to under a week. So much easier, right? So insane that for a few years, people still did both. Imagine two competing travel companies. Huh, I don't know which one to pick. The Oregon Wagon Express will get us there maybe in four to five months if we don't dive so many things. And we'll have to basically walk the whole fucking way. And it costs $1,000. Or I can pay 40 bucks. <laughs> no one has to die or walk or learn how to steer a wagon. And the Railroad Express will get me there in less than a week. Hmm. From 1866 to 1888, the trail primarily used for cattle drives, wagon trains occasionally seen crossing the trail until the 1880s. By 1890, no need to travel by wagon due to expansive railroad tracks reaching all over the country. Now let's get the fuck out of this timeline. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Before a quick home stretch, another uh, final sponsor break, a, a very important one. This episode of Time Suck is brought to you by Diddle. Defend innocent dolphin dick from lovemaking experiments. Did you know that every year, fake scientists fuck literally thousands of male dolphins in disturbing sex experiments in order to try and figure out how to speak telepathically to aliens? Well, okay, I mean, maybe that's not entirely 100% true, but I do know that's happened at least one time. And I know that Peter shared his sweet, sweet dolphin dick with a lady unwilling to fully commit to a lifetime of dolphin love, leading him to die of heartbreak. And I know that one dolphin death is too many. 
So please go to diddle.com and click to, on to donate. Don't be a dolphin fucker. Be a dolphin fucker stopper. Support diddle and get to diddling before another dolphin dick is used, abused, and just tossed casually to the side. Are you crying yet? Uh, thanks for listening, guys. That very important message. It reminded me a lot of that Sarah McLaughlin thing with the dogs, but, you know, with dolphin dicks instead. How did all this expansion affect native tribes who already lived in Western territory? The Great Migration of 1843 marked the year things changed forever for Western native tribes and various recorded skirmishes while killing about 360, you know, travelers. Tribes lost about 400 to combat. They lost so many more to disease, smallpox, cholera, measles, other illnesses for which the tribes had no natural immunity, wiped out about 90% of some tribes during the busiest 20 years of the Oregon Trail. Another massive negative impact to the trail for many tribes was the near extinction of the bison. By 1850, huge herds of thousands of bison are dying out. Bison lived in the plains from the 1300s to the early 1800s, thrived in the wetter and cooler climate near Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas. From 1825 to 1850, traffic along the Santa Fe Trail disrupted their herds, and then bison hunters were killing up to 25,000 bison a year. In the 1860s, conflicts increased further between the U.S. Army and Plains tribes, mostly due to the expansion of railroad lines out west. And then the Army provided free ammo to hide hunters, who would then hunt the bison to near extinction. And that was done to hurt the tribes. The government recognized how important the bison were to indigenous people, so to subdue them, they killed their main food source. By 1894, Yellowstone National Park had the only known wild herd in the U.S. And just like we went over the Trail of Tears suck, treaty after treaty after treaty removed tribes from ancestral lands, placed them for the most part on smaller and smaller reservations as more white settlers headed west. So, manifest destiny in the Oregon Trail, great for the strength of the new emerging world power of the United States, terrible for local tribes. Guessing you already knew that. Human history littered with tales of the conquering and the conquered. In the story of the Oregon Trail, one of these tales. So what happened to the trail once people stopped using it? Well, rail tracks were sometimes laid directly over trail paths. After the trail stopped being used for travel, it was still used for cattle and sheep drives and places for a bit. And then the land, you know, the trail was on, was sold, farms wiped it away, paved roads placed over it, shopping centers, schools, on and on. Today, tourists can see remnants of the trail here and there. Number of forts once along the trail are now national, state, local historical sites. In 1978, Congress authorized the establishment of the Oregon Trail, I'm sorry, the Oregon National Historic Trail, to preserve and maintain little parts of the route. Today, the trail managed by the National Park Service, what's left of it. Uh, for decades, there have been laws passed to preserve monuments and parts of the trail and for historical associations to keep memories of the trail fresh in the American mind, books, films, celebrations. The National Park Service has ensured we can never forget the importance of the trail. And of course, that sweet Oregon Trail educational video game used by so many kids to learn about life on the trail, the one where I lived and I was fine and all my fucking weaker associates here died, you know? Uh, I couldn't find numbers, but how many people played that game? A couple hundred million? I wasn't terribly painful to listen to me play today. I had fun. I hope you had fun. I hope you had fun with the whole thing. Now let's recap uh, some of the some of the most important parts of what we learned with today's top five takeaways and also, of course, learn one more new thing. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, the Oregon Trail was a, you know, roughly 2,000 mile long route from Missouri to Oregon country and also California, tracing the banks of several rivers, crossing the plains, deserts, western mountains of North America. Immigrants faced many hardships along the way, accidents, cholera, extreme weather, starvation. Those who made it rewarded with as much as 640 acres of land, a dream unfathomable for many people living in big cities in the East. Number two, manifest destiny. Estimated 250,000 to 500,000 immigrants crossed the Oregon Trail to find land for themselves, first with the Oregon Land Donation Act, then the Homestead Act, just like God wanted. Number three, contrary to popular belief, the trail was not full of violence between whites and natives. Whites killed around 400 natives. Natives killed around 360 whites and documented skirmishes along the Oregon Territory settlement days. Uh, during the uh, settlement days, most of the conflicts instigated by whites who were suspicious of local tribes. Number four, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad on May 10th, 1869 brought an end to the need for the Oregon Trail. Railroad transport just made it way faster and easier and cheaper to make the journey west. As new modern technologies came about, the trail was largely forgotten and regarded as an old-fashioned thing of the past by most Americans. And then number five, new info, lady pants. One interesting piece of the trail history involves bloomers. Amelia Jenks Bloomer was a suffragist, women's magazine editor from New York. She started a dress reform movement in 1851 by wearing pantaloons under a short skirt. Amelia Bloomer's articles were picked up by the New York Weekly Tribune. Interest in Amelia Bloomer's, uh, in Amelia's bloomers quickly spread. Bloomers first appeared in California and Oregon in 1851. 
She was initially ridiculed for her dress slash pants combo, but then uh, a lot of young women were like, I love this practical outfit. And uh, they purchased bloomers for the journey west. It made it easier to walk around, get in the water, not have spiders crawl into their vaginas, guessing, and it prevented fire hazards, which were more common than you would think. Women's dresses often caught on fire when they were cooking over open flames. Unfortunately, this trend did not catch on for most women. They stuck with their long, heavy skirts and criticized the bloomer girls for being immodest. Oh, pants. You can kind of see the shape of your legs. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Oregon Trail has been sucked. Hope you enjoyed the journey. Thank you to the Time Suck team, uh, the Bad Magic Productions team, for all their help in making Time Suck every week. Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley. Thanks to Zach Flannery, the script keeper, uh, for, you know, helping us here with a variety of things every week. Olivia Lee for doing the uh, initial research on this one. Thanks to Bit Elixir for keeping the Time Suck app running smooth. Logan the Art Warlock, Keith, our creative director, creating all the merch at badmagicmerch.com and more. Thanks to Lizzie Enchantress Hernandez, who runs our Cult of the Curious Facebook private page, currently Cult of the Curious 2, along with her, excuse me, wonderful All Seen Eyes moderators. And she helps Logan with socials. And thanks to Beefsteak. And his mod squad keeping over 10,000 meat sacks happy over on Discord. Next week is the week of Halloween. What spooky son of a bitch should be sucked? How about somebody, uh, one of their nicknames or monikers is Dr. Satan. Dr. Satan, a.k.a. French World War II serial killer, Dr. Marcel Petiot. Next week on Time Suck, we find ourselves back in the midst of World War II for some insane true horror. Imagine what it would be like to have your nation invaded, conquered by Nazis, have your neighbors rounded up, be put to death for their ethnicity. Then imagine a brave group of your fellow countrymen decide to smuggle out the people that are being targeted. And that's great. That's good. That's noble. And then a fucking serial killer pretends to be one of these brave, noble countrymen, a real wolf in sheep's clothing, devil disguised as an angel, uses the same underground salvation pipeline as a way to murder the fuck out of people seeking refuge from other evil men. Next Monday, we go full evil on Halloween week to talk about a super deranged son of a bitch who did exactly that. Marcel Petiot, a French serial killer who murdered Jews and Gentiles alike as they tried to escape the German Gestapo after the Nazis invaded France. And the story won't just be about murders. It was a complicated character. This Petiot led a crazy life. He was a somehow a semi-successful politician despite being a known criminal. Also an alleged inventor, which included secret weapons that probably don't exist. And he was a doctor with a decent reputation despite not really being qualified to be a doctor. Petiot was thought of as a French resistance hero for a time until his unprecedented crimes were discovered in his weird murder mansion. Dude got away with likely stealing millions and millions of francs from his perhaps 60 or more victims. Victims who thought they had finally found someone to help them. Tune in to The Suck next Monday to unravel another real piece of shit. Marcel Petiot, one of the many villains of the World War II era, but even for those wild times, especially bad. And now before all that bad, let's hear some good on this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. First up, young sucker Solid Sack Cody Sears has a birthday greeting she would like to share. Cody writes, Dear the Suckmaster, Hi, I hope you, the queen of the suck and the little sucklings are having a great day. My name is Cody Sears. Yeah, we're having a good day. I'm 23 years old from Texas and I love time suck. You say Texas, Cody? <laughs> do, 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 do. I have that suck in my head now. Bang, ding, 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 ding. Uh, I was really introduced to the world of the suck by my boyfriend, Peter Keller. I'm so glad he trusted me enough to share his favorite and super fucking crazy awesome <laughs> thank you podcast with me. It has now become one of our main topics of discussion. I'm actually writing this email in the hopes that you will wish him a happy birthday on or near November 2nd. I figured if I start emailing now and continue every week until then, maybe just maybe one of my emails will get to you. Thanks for creating such, thanks for creating such a fun and thought provoking work of art. Oh, that's very nice. It feels just like madness most times. Uh, Meter and I, Peter, Meter, Meter and I, Meter would be an interesting name. Peter and I both know your podcast will never disappoint. We uh, will leave every episode having our, uh, having scratched our heads, looked at each other with our no fucking way glances, laughed our asses off, had a heartfelt moment, and let's be honest, probably had to rewind a bit because you mentioned something sexy and we were making out a bit. Hey, Lucifina. Anyways, love the suck. You and all the Time Suck champions, y'all are amazing sacks. Thank you, best Cody Sears. Well, Cody, first off, I love the way your name's spelled. K-O-D-I-E. Super cool. I hadn't seen that one. Uh, second, thanks for the kind words. You're too nice. And third, happy birthday to your lover, Peter. And that's that's a human Peter, right? After last week, I worry about Peter the Dolphins, you know, being taken advantage of sexually <laughs> by, by overly adventurous young women. If uh, Peter is a dolphin, Cody, now you have to keep fucking him forever because you'll get so sad if you don't. If he's a human, congrats. You two sound uh, like you're having a fun relationship. Hail Nimrod and hail Lucifina. And now two sweet sacks or maybe one two-headed sack. 
or maybe one split personality sack has some silliness to share. JK, she signed the messages, Bethany and Walter, but only Bethany writes, dear suck master supreme, are we not going to talk about how dolphins have a spiral shaped vaginal cavity and how this freak John Lilly, excuse me, had a dad <laughs> and how this freak John Lilly had a dad named Dick Coyle. Am I the only one who immediately thought this and laughed my ass off? Anyway, because of your nasty ass podcast, I met the man. I'm married in a week. Let me explain. I found your podcast while being a barely functioning binge drinker, working a crappy dead end job. Over the years, I realized that the first space lizard I met in the wild, I would marry. This reasoning was in part because no other meat sack would ever appreciate my dark, twisted humor. Uh, and I knew that anyone living with me would have to have common traits of liking to learn and listening to your bullshit while I work in my creative pursuits. Before I met my soon-to-be husband, I was spiraling down a self-destructive path that had gotten me into two car accidents in the span of a month. 24 hours after getting into the before-mentioned second accident, my concussed ass went to a bar to meet one of those idiots of the internet, and I slipped out a Hail Lucifina, to which he responded, no way, you're a time sucker too? And in that mo moment, I knew it was all over. This is it. In the next few weeks, COVID-19 caused shutdowns. I moved in with a practical stranger, and I wouldn't change a fucking thing. So thank you for being a starting point on building a relationship with the meat sack that cheers me on to learn and create and encourages, uh, you know, both of us to be our best selves. Lastly, we've been binge listening to your mush mouth nonsense to distract us from the stress of our pending nuptials or lately. If you could give my now husband a shout out this week with a congratulations, you degenerate, uh, insert your own debauchery here. How about fuck face dolphin dick suck and collar loophole juice drinker? Uh, okay. Hail is Fina. Yours truly and unfortunately, Bethany and Walter. Walter, congrats on marrying someone who sounds like a lot of fun. Hail Lucifina. May she uh, join your naughty fun bits, often and always. Bethany, uh, thanks for sharing such a cool story. Uh, good for you, pursuing love and your dreams and you fucking go get it. Excuse me, man. Someone's going crazy. And uh, yes, huge missed opportunity with Dick Coyle. It was right there. Ball was on the tee. And by ball, I mean dolphin puss. And I swung and I missed. Uh, bummer. But you got it, so we still got to reference it. Now more inspiration from dog fucker, I mean dog fosterer, Samantha Wyatt. Samantha writes, Dear Suck Master Supreme, this is your loyal space leader, Samantha Wyatt, coming at you from Yakima, Washington. It's going to be a long one, so strap on those boots, soldier. First, I'll tell you about myself. I'm 30 years old and totally blind since birth. And believe me when I say the blindness is the least of what's wrong with me. I was born with septo-optic dysplasia and optic nerve hypoplasia. This means the septum in the middle of my brain didn't grow properly in one little spot. In my case, my optic nerves only grew to one-tenth of their normal size, so they didn't connect to my brain. The spot where my defect happened is also where the pituitary gland is. If you don't already, already know, the pituitary, yeah, the pituitary is the body's hormone center. Uh, my pituitary function is hit and miss, so I have to take medications to replace my hormones. Even before COVID was a thing, my life was on a different path. Because of the blindness, I can't keep a normal sleep schedule. The cells in my brain that control circadian rhythm don't get any cues to tell me when it's light or dark outside. Side question, if my sleep runs on my hormones and my hormones, hormones run on my sleep, how many times have I been fucked over? Anyway, I dealt with sleep issues my whole life and never had a label for it until a few years ago. It's called non-24 sleep-wake disorder. Affects mostly blind people. Such a long story. It won't all fit in this message, but I've been on an eight-year journey of acceptance. It was rough at first, I went through therapy, found new purposes for my life, uh, laid old dreams to rest. Now I'm just trying to focus on my quality of life, sleeping when my brain wants to sleep, living my best life when I'm awake, even if it's 3 a.m. I started fostering dogs for my local pet rescue so I would have someone to take care of besides myself and love every minute of it. I have perfect pitch and love to sing, so my mom started taking me out to karaoke every weekend. That's great. That's awesome. I got a place of my own so I don't have to tiptoe around sleeping people all the time, and they don't have to do the same for me. But then COVID came along and took a big bojangle size shit all over everything. I got sick in May of 2020 and like the suck master, didn't have any of the respiratory symptoms or even a fever. In fact, I thought it was just allergies for the first few weeks because I got headaches or I get headaches during allergy season. Tested negative for COVID at the time. Tested positive for antibodies a few weeks after that. My doctor drew blood, tested for them because I was still having symptoms. I'm what people call a long hauler. Still have symptoms almost 18 months later. I get headaches and body aches every day, constant fatigue and brain fog and so much more. Fuck, that sucks. One day I was laying in bed feeling like hammered owl shit, bored because I'd run out of things to entertain me, turned on episode one of The Suck, heard your stand-up before on Pandora and loved it. I remember hearing your ad for The Suck and thought I'd see what it was all about. Started with episode one, fell in love right away, been binging ever since. Ah, oh, thank you. Between Time Suck Is We Dumb and The Secret Suck, you've completely ruined my ability to watch regular TV. I'll be watching a show on Netflix with my mom, thinking about how I can't wait to listen to the next suck. Sometimes the headaches are so bad, all I can do is lay in bed in the quiet and wish for death or recovery. Sometimes the only thing I can tolerate is something playing softly on my phone. 
You, Suckmaster, everybody at Bad Magic, create, you're creating something beautiful. You help me get through every day by distracting me from my pain, and I get story time and some much-needed laughs. You guys are a light for me through these dark times, pun definitely intended. You may decide not to read this on the Time Sucker updates because it's so long now, but I just wanted to reach out and tell you what an impact you're making. Hail Nimra, praise Bo Jangles, and keep on sucking. Your forever loyal space lizard, Samantha Wyatt. P.S. I fostered a dog to my local rescue who was burned in a wildfire. Fuck, in 2016. My family and I spent a year nursing him back to health. I adopted him, trained him to be my service dog. He's a pit bull husky mix. He's a big teddy bear full of love. Every time you mention Bojangles now being fierce, all I can picture is my sweet teddy bear laying on his back asking for belly rubs. His name is Bernie because he was burned. I'm an asshole I know. I bring this up because now I find myself affectionately calling him Burn Jangles. PPS, today is October 15th. Coming to your show in Spokane and I can't fucking wait. Samantha, you wonderful dog fucker, you. I mean, dog fosterer. Praise Bojangles and praise his sweet cousin, Burn Jangles, as well. I love your sense of humor. I find your story inspiring. You've pushed past blindness, hormone regulation problems, a sleep disorder, and a pandemic, aches, all so much stuff. Hail Samantha motherfucking Wyatt. I hope you had fun at the Spokane show. I recorded this October 15th, just a few hours before the show. And I hope we can bring you more light in the darkness and also horrific tales of serial killers and dolphin puss. Now for humor. Humiliated sack, Victoria Morgan, has to find a new mechanic. She writes, I want to start this off by saying, I always thought 90% of the Cummins Law updates were made up horseshit from people who wanted shout outs until today. I was halfway through the new episode about the Dolphin Point experiment when I took my car to get a much needed checkup. My Prius has pretty good Bluetooth range. I never turn the Bluetooth off on my phone, so it just automatically connects every time I get in the car. And the phone automatically begins to play the last thing you were listening to when the Bluetooth connects to the car speakers. About 10, 15 minutes into my appointment, I looked down on my phone only to realize that the poor mechanic was getting an ear full of dolphin sex and David Hatcher Childress. God damn it. Of all the episodes it could have played. I've got a great relationship with the owner of that service station. Unfortunately, I will never be able to show my face there again. You're right, Victoria. You're gonna have to find a new mechanic. It's gonna be very hard to explain listening to uh, stories about dolphin fucking, you know, to a lot of people. Best of luck. And uh, hope a future episode doesn't ruin, ruin a future ep- uh, relationship with another mechanic. Actually, that would be a great story for the rest of us, but, but kind of sorry though. And now a last message, a dad sucker. Hopefully not a serial killer like so many dads. Douglas Hare writes, Time Suck Team, I guess I got someone somewhat Cummins Law today. Doesn't really affect me too much because he's my son. He's cool as hell, but let's just say he uh, wasn't ready for what he was hearing. I was in the shower this morning, blaring 265, uh, the Dolphin Point Experiment. I was laughing hysterically at the monkey orgasms and jerking off dogs. And I opened the door while you said he was professional beagle jerker offer to a wide open mouth and look of utter confusion from my 12-year-old son, which made it all the more hilarious. Hail Lucifina. Well, Douglas, I think that boy of yours is now a man. Once you've heard shit like that, I don't think you're, I don't think you can be a kid anymore. Make sure being a pro beagle jerker offer isn't a noble profession and something to inspire, you know, aspire to. Make sure your son realizes that. Uh, make sure he really knows that being an amateur beagle jerker offer is even worse. And keep having fun with your kid. Keep having fun, everybody. Listen to this. I, I hope you're still enjoying the ride. Hail Nimrod, everyone. Suckers, I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast, Meat Sacks. Maybe don't start a 2,100 mile plus long wagon trip this week. It sounds super hard and dangerous and, you know, like it just fucking sucks. Maybe just, instead of that kind of sucking, you just keep listening to Time Suck and just keep on sucking that way. Bad Magic Productions. Uh, hey. Dan. Yeah, 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 yeah. You killed me. Yeah. Zach. I know. Lindsay and Logan. I know. On the Oregon Trail. The, but the buns are, I you was won. confused. Oh, you're hoping you're alive. I figured out after you guys died. Oh, so that, typical Dan. Kill everybody and then figure it out when they're dead. Wow. I mean, it's, I mean, it's still kind of cool that I made it. They were holding me back.